Good uh, morning. It's still morning, yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lukulumango, Lukulumango Nando, and I will be your co MC for the day. You will meet the other MCs um, the day progresses. Apologies, number one, for starting late. I am aware of what we are running behind schedule than the anticipated time, but as you can see, not everyone whom we expected to be here is here right now, but we don't want to delay you any further. So what will happen is we will start with the program and as other guests arrive, they'll just quietly join in on the conversation and we'll keep it going until the very last speaker that we have planned for the day. Um, I'm not going to take much of your time, but before we start, there is a request for us to have a minor couple of um, safety notices. So I'm going to ask Umis Masabata to quickly, dump, to quickly come down and give us some safety notices um, about the building in case anything happens. God forbid. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Masabata Potane. I'm the event and marketing coordinator at Saratech. Um, in line with our occupational health and safety policy, I would like to inform you of the health and safety aspects of the Saratech building. In case of emergency, an alarm or verbal instructions will be given. Please move to your nearest exit, clearly marked exit, the doors at the back. Please make yourself familiar with the evacuation plans on the tables. There is some notice with regards to our health and safety policy and plans placed in visible areas, invisible, thank you, invisible areas in, in each venue and in the passages. Saratech Assembly Point is located at the parking area in front of the building. In case of fire, fire extinguishers are located in each venue and fire marshals shall make themselves known, so please um, follow their instructions. In case of medical emergency, please inform any Saratech staff members and Saratech first aiders will be sent to assist. Note all vehicles are parked at own risk and the management of Cape Peninsula University of Technology and Saratech will not be responsible or liable for any damage, loss, and injury resulting from any cause or whatsoever. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Masabata. Um, she said that, and then I saw a couple of facial expressions of people be like, and no, especially when it got to the part of you are parked at your own risk. And everyone was suddenly like, I bon um, Just to quickly run through our program before we get to the gist of why we are here today. Our program has been divided into three sessions. So we are currently in the first session. After the first session, we will break for um, lunch and then we'll follow it by the second session. Thereafter, we'll then have our third session and then we'll close it after that. So it is quite a lengthy program. I will ask that all our speakers to please adhere to the time that they've been allocated. If you can be you know, shorter than the time that you've been allocated, that will also be greatly welcomed. Just a few notices. Let's please remember to put our phones on silent or on vibrate. In case you need to go to the loo, you can use the exit that I believe we all came through. Go straight up. And then all the loose is on the left, right. Left, yeah. I'm left-handed, so whenever I have to do left, right, I have to think left and right, so apologies. Um, which is on the left, yeah. You'll find all the loose there. Just a slight disclaimer, if you do enter the loose and the dark, don't be scared. Just give it like maybe two, three seconds, and then the lights will pop in again. It works on a sensor, but the sensor is a bit delayed for some weird reason. So we will now call upon our acting director, Umama Ukuselwa, to give us our opening remarks and mainly to tell us why we are all here today. May you please welcome her with a round of applause. Thank you very much. A very warm CPUT welcome to you all and to our guests who are 
online. We have a live stream, and this is taking place at our CPUT News, our YouTube. This is the first of a series of crucial conversations that are being planned. The theme for today's conversation is Voices and Spaces, Creating Inclusive Spaces. The hosts for the event, it is the Center for Diversity, Inclusivity and Social Change, as well as our Pillar 6, uh, which looks at research and information management within our Institutional Gender-Based Violence Committee. So we are the hosts. The background to the cr crucial conversation emanates from the fact that there are challenges that have been identified relating to the current approaches that are being used within the institution. And therefore, these challenges indicate to us that we are really not addressing issues of inclusion of trans and gender diverse students. Now, these challenges are also outlined in detail in a model policy framework for inclusion of trans and gender diverse students within higher education in South Africa. I cite a few of these. These are inclusivity within administrative processes, within educational framework, within health care services, student housing, institutional cultural practices, as well as sporting codes. With these challenges then, we have identified the purpose of us coming together, being to amplify diverse voices. So we mean to provide a platform and opportunities for individuals to share their stories, their perspectives, their experiences. We are hoping that this platform is going to help us to foster dialogue and understanding. So we're going to therefore encourage all of us in the program to be open and to really engage in the conversation. We're looking at addressing systematic inequalities and look at the barriers and hopefully our understanding of all of this is going to enable us to formulate policies at CPUT and practices at CPUT that are really truly going to affirm the fact that we see ourselves as a diverse community. We see as ourselves as a community where everybody needs to feel they belong and they are safe and we live together in a space where there is social cohesion. So I'm going to give over to our program director and a very warm welcome to all. I hope we're going to have a brilliant, rigorous engagement during this day. Thank you. Thank you, Um With what Umamu Kuselwa has said, I think we can, <clears throat> sorry, we can all agree that when we're in an institution of higher learning, and that means we are surrounded by scholars, we are surrounded by researchers, and Within that, there's always debate that usually takes place within institutions of higher learning. And that means we need to be tolerant with one another because we may not necessarily agree with what someone else is saying. But also this is a space for us to learn and perhaps maybe unlearn certain things in order for us to ultimately create the open and safe space that Mamu Kusello is speaking about for all in our institutions and not only our students, but also our students and our staff members as well from the executive to the least. And I would really encourage Uguti in our question and answer and our engagement sessions that everyone who's here 
to please engage, please ask questions, please share the little that you know, because what you know may be what I don't know. And that's how we'll actually start to, you know, learn and engage with one another. But moving along with our program, we will now have Dr. Johannes Butelezi, who is a lecturer from the Faculty of Education, who will be sharing research findings on the exclusion of transgender students in South African higher education institutions. Just a quick <clears throat> um, biography on Dr. Johannes. Johannes Butelezi was born in Kwakwa and raised in Tembisa. He earned his teaching qualification in 2013 from the University of Johannesburg. With seven years of teaching experience in a township high school, Johannes possesses invaluable first-hand insights into the challenges and challenges and opportunities inherent to the South African education system. This practical background serves as a strong foundation for his research. As a teacher, he worked with school-based support teams to create safe learning environments for learners with LGBT2 identities. He had a support group that assisted learners with LGBT identities in a school where he was employed. Working with young adults helped him understand the challenges and discrimination that learners face in schools. Currently, Johannes holds the position of NCAP, New Generation of Academic Program Lecturer in the Faculty of Education at CPUT. He's a doctor of philosophy in inclusive education. His research portfolio predominantly focuses on the inclusion of students with transgender, with transgender identities, emphasizing the crucial role played not only by lecturers, but also by security guards and administrators in providing support to students with diverse sexual orientation and gender expressions. Through his academic endeavors, Johann, Johannes aims to shed light on the distinct challenges that these individuals encounter within the educational system and actively advocates for the adoption of more inclusive policies and practices. Ladies and gentlemen, let us please welcome Dr. Mutelezi. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director. Um, can you please? Up. Okay, I'm not used to this. <laughs> Is it fine? Okay. Um, Thank you so much for the invitation so that I can share my study on inclusion and exclusion of transgender students in South African higher education. Um, I will start by giving you the purpose of this, uh, of this particular study. Um, I've identified that there are a number of studies based on you know, transgender students and learners and so on. And however, when I did the research, we have also identified uh, uh, from the research findings that the issue of exclusion in higher education, it still persists. So the main purpose basically it was to have, write this paper so that we can have a conversation about this particular matter. So probably some of the results you might feel like they are, you know, they are there, out there. We do acknowledge in the paper that some of the things that we have discovered, you know, they were discovered at some point. However, we want to have this engagement to say, as academics, for instance, why do we keep on writing papers, but we don't go back to the ground and, and assist in terms of implementation, implementing what we have, you know, identified in, in our research studies. 
So basically, the, the first thing that I will do, the, my presentation basically, it's gonna, I'm, going, I'm going to talk about the background of the study, the purpose of the study, then I will give you the findings of this particular study. There, there, there were two important um, purpose or the aims of this particular study. The first aim was to basically investigate how students with transgender identities navigate their lives within institutions of higher learning. So we wanted to find out how is life in university or in, in, in a college. Um, then also we wanted to find out, you know, to determine the level of inclusivity within this higher education um, institutions in South Africa. Now, literature, literature reveals that, the, that universities have inclusive policies and support systems, you know, to respond, you know, to the challenges of the LGBTQI community or to the transgender um, 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 individuals. But the problem is there's lack of practice and implementation of these policies within, the, within, the, 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 within higher education. Policies are there. They are shelved somewhere. Um, no one is implementing these particular policies. Hence, we, we wrote this paper. And, and the first policy that we need to, to talk about, all of us, we know the South African Constitution, for instance, it's clear that everyone is equal within the law. However, through this study, we have discovered that there are some individuals that are treated, by, are treated better than other individuals within higher education. Let me make an example. One of the participants you know, said to, to, to us, I'm struggling to play sport in, in my institution because the first thing that they do when I, when, when I want to participate, the first question that, that, that they ask me is, are you male or female? And, and, and it's quite difficult to answer that particular question because I'm still transitioning. I haven't changed my, 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 you know, my ID in terms of the gender marker there. So now, in other words, the participant could not play, can't participate in any sport due to the fact that basically, you know, they, 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 their gender marker says they are male, but they, they identify themselves as, as, as a female. So, so that misalignment in, in, the, in, in, in our institutions of higher learning, it's, it's problematic. For instance, we've got the policy that says the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act number four of 2000. It is, it is clear that any individual who wants to change their agenda marker, they should be allowed to do so. However, in institutions of higher learning, we continue to, to ask our students to say, are you male or are you female? Then if, 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 for instance, I categorize myself as a, as a male, but I was born with, with a vagina, for instance, then I can't participate. There, there are some things that I can't do because of my genitals, you know. So, so other, other spaces that are very exclusive in institutions of higher learning. It's housing, student residence. You know, students, especially in first year, students, they share rooms. You know, if I was born with a penis, I will share a room with someone who has a penis because the assumption is I am male, but I'm not comfortable to share that space with this particular individual. And anyway, probably it's not even about me, but what about this heterosexual or, or, or cisgender man that I'm sharing the room with, are they comfortable to share that space with me? Now, 
let's talk about gender neutral bathrooms. How many institutions in South Africa drew this study because we have studied four institutions. There was only one institution that has a gender, a, a gender neutral bathroom. And, and, and the funny part, the participant said to us, even though there is, there, there, there are, you know, gender neutral bathrooms, it is, they are only two in the whole institution. So for instance, if I'm attending the other side, uh, let me make an example with us at CPUT. If, if the gender, the, 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 the bathroom is next to the library, then I'm attending this side. There's a possibility that I won't have access to that bathroom. So those spaces are, are very heterosexual, uh, 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 cisnormative, and they promote heterosexuality. Now, we, we, I've conducted this study, you know, in four, in, in four institutions, um, in, in three different provinces. Is it three? One, two, three, four, five. In five provinces, yes. And I will share what Champ said. Um, it's very interesting because Champ could not, you know, access student residence, and 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 he decided to stay at home um, because of the ex exclusion that are there in in institutions of higher learning. So through this study, we identified two themes after data, co data collection. The first theme is about the identification and access systems. You know, when we talk about the, the access gate, you know, um, then the, the, the other theme spo speaks about physical facilities. Now, let's, let's take this example from um, this was Mshopi, who took this picture. The other thing that I didn't mention about this study, we did, I collected data through photo, through arts-based method, where participants were supposed to take pictures and also to draw and tell. So they took pictures, then we had a conversation to say, what does this particular picture mean? Uh, what does this drawing mean, and so on. Then this is the picture that Tim Shopi took, you know, and, and I just want to read what Tim Shopi said based on this particular picture. I did, you know, during the discussive uh, uh, process, I did ask Tim Shopi, Tim Shopi, what does this picture mean to you? Why did you take this picture? And, and he, and he said, you know what, you, when you go to the, when you go to the, to the institution or to the student residence, your, your challenges as a student with transgender identity starts there. Because there you meet security guards. And those security guards, they will question who are you? Why? Because the, 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 the photo that you have and the physical appearances that you are portraying at this particular moment, they are different. The gender marker, it is also different because when I, you know, when, 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 when he, when, when, when I applied to that particular institution, I was still a mister. Now there's, there's a photo that says I am a man a cisgender man, and there's a gender marker that I am a mister. But at this particular moment, I identify myself as a trans woman. So now you will have those conversations with security guards. And those securities, they will question you. They will, they will question your identity. They will question who are you? Why are you here? And, and, and sometimes they will even accuse you of fraud to say, no, you are using someone else um, access card. Now the problem, according to Mshopi, the problem with this is they question you in front of everyone. People that you don't know. 
people that you attend with, that's basically, you know, humiliating. And it's quite difficult to deal with those effects afterwards. Now, let me just, Mshopi also took this particular, just to emphasize um, uh, um, the issue of student cards. He said, because they, security guards, believe that my student card does not belong to me. Same issue with my, my student card where I had to explain myself all the time. I have accepted that the transition will never be easy, an easy journey, and challenges are part of the journey. I will come across a security guards who will harass me because my student card reflects a male, even when they were aware of my gender identity or sexuality as a transgender, they will still harass me. So according to Mshopi, that process, basically exclusion does not start in the institution, it starts at the entry point. So they, 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 they are harassed, you know, even when they try to access the institution. Now, this is a transgender man who took this photo, um, Champ. And, and Champ took this particular photo and, and during the, the discussive process, he narrated to say, I want you to concentrate on this particular corridor. When I walk there, I've got a decision to make. I've got two options, only two options when I have to go to the bathroom. It's either I go to the other side or I go to the other side. But the problem is, if I go to the other side, I'm, go I'm going to make male students feel uncomfortable. And probably they can even harass me as well. But also because my transitioning process is not yet complete, I can't go to the female bathroom. Now, he says, you know, I spent, because he, he, he's doing, um, he's studying science. He said, I spent almost seven hours in the institution, but I, I, I don't go to the bathroom the whole day because I'm afraid that if I go there, I will be harassed. If I go there, you know, it will be a parade. Those students behind me, they will be waiting to see what's my decision, right? So imagine avoiding this space in the institution. Now, and, and, and just to, 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 to also emphasize this point, this reminds me of Fakao. Fakao who says, the LGBTQI community is under surveillance. And they are under surveillance in the sense that if they deviate from the norm, they will be punished. So, so for Champ, I don't want, for Champ, he, do, he does not want to deviate from the norm. That's why he avoids those particular spaces. But the question is, what are we doing about it as institutions of higher learning? Now, this is another, this is a drawing that, you know, Ace drew, you know, and, and Ace here talks about, she talks about the issue of student residence where she was forced to share a room with a cisgender woman, with a cisgender ma male, I'm sorry, because she's, she's, she's a transgender Woman. So she was forced to share a room with a, a male student. She said it was a difficult year. Um, she even failed some of the modules that she was doing during her first year and so on. So it's quite difficult for transgender students in our institutions. Now, this this drawing, you know, this participant, Tendi, drew this particular 
drawing. And, and according to Tendi, when we had an engagement, Tendi said, I was in the bathroom with one of my lecturers. And, and this lecturer told me that I don't belong there. Why? Because I am a boy. Why am I using the female bathroom? And, and the, 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 the difficult part that makes me not to understand why this lecturer was saying this thing to this particular participant is, Tendi said, I, I, I normally visit her office and, and I tell her about my challenges about being a transgender student. But now we meet in the bathroom, then she utter those words to say, I don't belong in that particular um, space within the institution. So it was basically hurting for, for Tendi. Now the question is, I'm wrapping up now, program director. The question is, so what does this mean? And, and I came to the conclusion that, firstly, we need to question the norm. These small practices, the things that we do in, a day, in our daily lives. For instance, the examples that we, 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 we make in our classrooms, in our lecture walls, the interactions that we, 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 we have you know, with our students, we need to question to say, are we inclusive or are we exclusive in those small you know, practices. We should ask ourselves to say, do we keep quiet when we see oppressive practices around us? And I want to take you to what Bishop Desmond Tutu said. He said, you know, and I quote, if you are neutral in a situation of injustice, you have chosen the, the, the side of the oppressor, I close the quotation. So in other words, we as academics, we as you know, activists, we need to question the norm. Now, this is my last, last slide, program director. Let me, in this paper, we basically recommend um, that in institutions of higher learning, we need to develop a system whereby we give our students a voice, especially those the, 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 the students that are marginalized or the, the, the oppressed group in our student population. We need to give them a voice so that they can assist us in terms of how can we support them and, and embrace this diversity, the diversity that we are talking about. So those regular assessments and feed, feedbacks from transgender students can help universities to identify and improve you know, our policies because the policies are there. But we, we, we basically, we are not using those policies because we keep on, you know, excluding transgender students. Now, we also need to learn to recognize, respect transgender human rights, because at the end of the day, each one of us have human rights, and we need to acknowledge and respect and embrace those particular human rights. I thank you, Program Director. Ngosi Dog, um, thank you for taking us through the lens, the lens rather, of a transgender student. You reminded me of a time when I used to belong to the CPUT Debate Society. We have a debate society for students who might not know and who might be interested in debate at CPUT. And a regular exercise we often would take in debate would be when you introduce yourself, you would state what your gender pronoun is or your preferred gender pronoun is. And 
debate being such a diverse platform with institutions from all over, you would hear you know, the different pronouns, some that you did not even know exist yourself. And that is part of the learning process that occurs. Um, I often get asked about my own gender pronoun because in my signature, I'm also a staff member at CPUT. And in my signature, it states my position and then it says, Mr. L.L. Nando. Then in between brackets, there's he, him. And people often don't understand why do I have a he, him in between brackets in my signature because people still don't understand the times we live in. They still don't take cognizant of the existence of different individuals among us. There's many people in this room and all, all of us being here does not necessarily mean we're all the same. Does not mean we all identify as the same, whether we're male, female, trans, hetero, pan, asexual. There's different forms of sexuality and there's different forms of, of gender pronouns. And I think that is, you know, opening up room for discussion, but not only that, also opening eyes for people. And I think it also opens room for respect for individuals. I mean, for example, if lecturers were to do that exercise with their students, we wouldn't get such comments as a lecturer asking a transgender woman, well, what are you doing in a female bathroom? Because that would have already been, perhaps maybe, opened up that discussion within when lecturers are introducing themselves to their students and students are introducing themselves back to, to their lecturers. And I think also at CPUT, we should be able to track progressive policies that we've also had or ask ourselves what progressive policies do we have in place? Because the issues of transgender, the issues of LGBTQI plus in general should not be an issue whereby the SRC comes to campaign about it and then afterwards we don't hear or see any tangible change or any tangible physical implementation or raising of any certain thing saying we're calling for certain policies to be introduced and to be implemented. And I agree with you, Doc, when you say, Uguti, there is a need for regular assessment. And I think that assessment must come with an engagement because what often happens is we often want to silence people and be the voice of people as if they cannot speak for themselves. In other words, you'll have people who are not trans wanting to be the voice of trans people and wanting to implement things for trans people as if trans people cannot speak for themselves, as if the LGBT tri plus community cannot speak for, for itself. Which is why I say I agree on the assessment, but I think Ugut, we also need to have engagements in between. Moving on, we will now call upon Ukanyisile Phillips from Gender Dynamics, who is the Education Programs Manager, who will be speaking on model policy framework for the inclusion of trans and gender diverse individuals within higher education. And quickly before I call upon Ukanyisile, Ukanyisile serves as the current Education Program and ILGA World Manager at Gender Dynamics. She stands as a prominent advocate for gender justice within Southern Africa. As a transgender woman of color herself, raised in the culturally vibrant yet often violent Cape Flats for gender and sexual minorities, she brings a wealth of experience and unwavering dedication to this pivotal role. Equipped with a Bachelor of Arts degree and a postgraduate certificate in education from the University of the Western Cape, she is currently pursuing her honours degree in sociology, majoring in policy analysis and organisational management. Kanyisile's journey as a passionate social and gender justice advocate began, began during her time as a student activist. Drawing profound inspiration from modern African and, more specifically, South African black intersectional feminist scholars infused with philosophies of Pumlangola, Sisonke Msimang, and Gobani Kambela. She forcibly champions gender, socioeconomic, and racial justice. Central to her activism and advocacy is the urgent need for policies and legal frameworks within institutions within institutions to embed a gender self-determination approach to meaningful inclusion. 
In her distinguished capacity as the Education Programs Manager at Gender Dynamics, Kanyisila continues to spearhead efforts towards a more equitable and inclusive society. She deeply draws from the insights and principles of modern black intersectional feminism, amplifying her steadfast commitment and, transmo and transformative change. Her leadership saves, serves rather, as an inspiring beacon of hope for marginalized communities across Southern Africa and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, help me please welcome Kanyisile Phillips. I'm going to start. I think everyone can hear me clearly, right? I've got a big voice. Um, so I'm Kanisila Phillips, and I'm the Education Program Manager at Gender Dynamics. Um, oh, this is not. This is not my presentation. So um, I think. Already, Dr. Butelezi has set the tone um, in terms of research that's been conducted, specifically um, their own research study, um, which will confirm a lot of the work that we do at Gender Dynamics and, of course, inform the need for um, model policy frameworks, uh, similar to the one that I will be presenting uh, today. But I think I wanted to start off by acknowledging that the knowledge that I will be imparting and the, the presentation that I'll be doing is really just a small part of the work that has been done, a very small part of the work that is about to begin. Um, and I want to acknowledge that there is possibly over five decades worth of knowledge in this room. So I am inviting you to interact. I'm inviting you to ask questions. I'm inviting you to, to think critically right, um, around these issues. Um, so I did introduce myself. I think to start us off, um, Dr. Butelezi really touched on a lot of the, the, the experiences of trans people. I just want to check what the time is because I was informed that I had 30 minutes and I would hate not to abide by the 30 minutes. So it is now seven minutes past 11. Please keep time with me. Um, I can get carried away. Um, okay, so the model policy framework is a framework for the inclusion of trans and gender diverse, a policy framework for the inclusion of trans and gender diverse people within South Africa, specifically students within South African higher education institutions. So a bit of an overview with regards to our, our presentation today would be, I've already introduced myself. Um, I'll start off with a quote from one of the students that we interviewed during our research study. We did. Um, phase one of our research study, and we are following that up this year with um, a phase two to complete the study. So we'll start off with that quote. We'll then look at some legal frameworks in the country, broad legal frameworks, and then specifically educational frameworks that, of course, give muscle to the model policy framework. Um, and then we'll look at some of the challenges, which, of course, Mam Kusela, as well as um, Dr. Butelezi has already touched on. Um, and then we'll look at another quote from another trans student, um, a, a colored woman, a colored transgender woman, um, who was invited to the launch of the model policy framework, and she gave us, um, she did the keynote address. And so I would like to use one of her quotes as well. 
I also want to touch on another research study that was conducted by the University of Pretoria, and this was specifically the Center for Human Rights and the, um, the Center for Sexualities, AIDS, and Gender, um, CSANG, at the university, as well as the uh, COP. Uh, for higher education and specifically for gender-based violence. Um, and then there is, um, we want to touch on the purpose and the function of the MPA for the model policy framework. Then we'll provide some um, overview of the recommendations provided in the document. Um, and then call to action, how you can get involved. And then we'll open it up for questions and answer or discussion, but that of course can happen later. Since I only have 30 minutes, so I need you to just bear with me. So to start off from with this quote from a student um, that was part of our research, so Gender Dynamics conducted a research study uh, from 2018. It was quite an extent, quite a long period that the study was conducted for multiple logistical reasons. But um, finally, the, the first phase of the study came, came to, together. Um, but it was really looking at the experiences, the needs, and the challenges of um, trans and gender diverse students within nine South African universities. So it was a national study. And the study, the, the person quoted in saying, and to confirm Dr. Butelezi, who said that, um, that policies are there, they are just shelved somewhere. So let's look at the confirmation from the student who gave us this quote more than two years ago. The person said that the university context has been a very painful journey there is an element of trying, so policies are there, sensitization training is available, but people have their own belief systems, and they are allowed to practice those. And sometimes that involves having discriminatory beliefs. The policies are there to protect the community, but they are hardly practiced. So in essence, policies that don't really have teeth. So, we, so how do we give muscle, or how does this model policy framework fit into the broader South African legal um, landscape and, of course, framework? The, the development of this policy framework is guided by, of course, our constitution, um, and then further legislation, which was also quoted previously, is the PAPUDA, which is the prevention of, sorry, the promotion of equality and the prevention of unfair discrimination act of 2000. We're also looking specifically um, at the alteration of sex description and sex status act, which is, which is commonly known as act 49, which is the act that does make provision for transgender people um, and gender diverse people to legally be recognized in the system, okay? Um, to amend their gender markers um, as well as uh, their names with the department. We also look at, it's also informed by the Higher Education Act um, of 1997, the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, the regulation on the registration of births and deaths of 2014, and then of course the Birth and Deaths Registration Act of um, 51 of 1992, and then the Criminal Law, uh, Sexual Offenses and Related Matters Amendment Act, as well as the Identification Act 68 of 1997, and then the Refugees Act um, 130 of 1998. So these are all of the, the law of, uh, pieces of legislation that we've consulted um, in order for us to be able to um, draft this model policy framework. So what are the institutional challenges impacting trans and gender diverse students? I'm not gonna to dwell too long on this slide because we've already gotten a good understanding of the institutional challenges impacting trans, specifically black and trans and gender diverse people of color. So, we note that trans and gender diverse people experience heightened vulnerability in, in, in educational spaces, whether that is in basic education or in higher education, right? Um, it really is, um, it's gross if, if you ask me. Then challenges ori originate within the institution, right? So here we're saying that the institution can do something about it. Um, and can be improved through remedying internal policies and promoting an inclusive environment. The institution is responsible to do and, and, and change the environment for trans and gender diverse persons' experiences. 
So a few specific um, challenges, which of course Mum Kuselwa was touching on, was that we experience administrative um, um, issues within administrative procedures. Um, and yeah, I, maybe a good example would be when I came in today, I saw I was um, filling out the registration form. And as I was going through, I saw that some, um, some people's gender has already been inserted, typed in to the registration form. And I was wondering why people didn't just assume mine because other people's has been assumed. Right? Um, because my block was empty, but then their blocks were all filled. Um, and so maybe starting even with that, we're saying that perhaps that block should have been left empty for someone else, to, for the person to decide how they identify and not for the person to who ever typed up that registration to say, oh, I know her, she identifies as female, right? Um, so we'll talk more about that, but that was a, a simple example, but yet an example that I noted this morning as I was coming in. And then there's, of course, within educational frameworks, yeah, we're speaking around curriculum um, and how curriculum not, never makes recognition of trans and gender diverse persons' experiences, specifically if we look at health science, um, the Faculty of Health Sciences and Health Sciences curriculum, right? And you will find that doctors and psychologists and all of those medical professionals graduate from, from higher education and they really decide who they want to service and who they don't want to service. Right, because um, my belief system or my, my cultural or religious beliefs does not align with your, what they call your lifestyle. So I can't support you, I can't examine you, right? Or I can't um, initiate you on, on medication that is required. Secondly, we're speaking around student housing residences um, and we'll touch a little bit more on that through the um, always on the edge research, which I was um, quoting on earlier on the University of Pretoria. Then we're speaking around in, um, institutional cultural practices. Here we can speak about, for example, a good example was um, that I heard from the University of, from Stellenbosch University, where they have this first year um, event that they normally hold, um, host in what they call the LAN, so the avenue in English. Um, and all first year students are usually encouraged to go out and enjoy this day where you can just kiss in, in the streets. Um, and you can just grab your partner or grab a person and you kiss. Anyone. So, but this is really a cis heteronormative um, kind of like practice, right? Because you would never find, and it was never encouraged that um, gay people, LGBTQ people, um, trans and gender diverse people should kiss because that is frowned upon with, by, by many of the students around, surrounding that space. Um, and there was this one year where activists, actually not from the institution, student activists from, um, C, from, from UCT actually went to Stellenbosch University and they actually went to, to um, gay men, went to go and kiss and it was such a big deal. It was even on the front page of newspapers. Um, to say that what is happening at, at Stellenbosch University. So th when we're speaking about cultural practices, that's just an example. Um, access to healthcare, facilities, bathrooms, ETC, and then sporting codes. So another quote from the student um, that we invited, um, Ilana Reikleef, who came to the launch of our model policy framework, which of course we have we launched in collaboration with many institutions. Um, with CPUT was also there. <laughs> CPUT, it was UWC, it was um, Stellenbosch University, um, and we were hosted by UCT, um, as well as the University of Fort Hare. So in her keynote address the model po um, at the Model Policy Framework and Colloquium, cum laude graduate and doctoral student Ilana Leah Rakeleaf reflected on her experiences as a colored trans woman and student at Stellenbosch University. In her experiential account, she posits her institution as a university that has a history of expunging queer identities in favor of hegemonic white cis heteronormativity and continues that 
What troubles her most is the direct, vi direct and violent removal of trans bodies from supposed safe spaces. So this brings us to some of the findings from Always on the Edge research, which of course we spoke about how resident spaces are highly contested spaces, but it's also spaces that really exclude trans and gender diverse identifying people and students specifically. So the study sought to explore uh, the situation in university residences in South Africa to investigate the challenges and issues related to meeting the needs of trans and gender diverse students within residence spaces. Um, and then thirdly, it was to emphasize that the final report serves as a snapshot. So it's not the entire um, story, but it is a snapshot um, and may not be um, generalizable, but it does reflect common experiences. So the final report then highlighted two broad themes, policy frameworks, which is they, they've identified opportunities and limitations. So lack of policy frameworks um, within higher education institutions, um, guiding actions and outdated policies needing revision and consistent delays in policy reform, um, as well as policy updates were identified, right? So we still um, navigate or uh, manage the institution on outdated policies, right? And we think that everyone coming into the institution should identify either as male or female and anyone who identifies beyond that is, um, now we have our backs up because what do we do with you, right? Um, and then of course, um, they also identified that there's struggles with capacity in institutions. Um, the study then mentioned that Residence managers, for example, and security staff, and those people are not trained, right? And so they do not know how to navigate these spaces with, um, with trans and gender diverse persons. Um, and so, again, the model policy framework is asking for the institution to recognize trans and gender diverse persons on the basis of gender self-determination. Right? Because if we look at Act 49 and how the Department of Home Affairs um, interpret the act when they serve as trans and gender diverse persons who are reaching out to amend their gender markers or their first names, they um, usually request uh, documentation from doctors and from psychologists to say, hey, this person is medically fine, psychologically fit to actually be amended in the, in the birth and death registers of the country. So, Again, that, 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 um, that burden of proof is placed on trans and gender diverse people to prove to the department that I am who I say I am, right? And that in and of itself is a gross violation of our own constitution. Um, and then of course there were issues with regards to residences um, that they've worked on, that these spaces are either not inclusive um, or they are work in progress, but for how long? So who does the model policy, of, um, the model policy apply to? Um, it really applies to government. It applies to um, any department or organ of state who is mandated to implement um, public policy and legislation. And this also includes bylaws. We note that broadly speaking, if we look a little bit outside of the institution, how trans and gender diverse persons are perceived by police officials, are perceived and assisted and perhaps even further um, traumatized by law enforcement, then we're speaking about um, uh, bylaws that, that, that also needs to be looked at. Um, and then this framework specifically applies to higher education institutions, um, including universities, colleges, technicons, and other learning places. So an overview of the recommendations include, first and foremost, as I've mentioned, Act 49 of 2003, which is the Alteration of Sex Description and Sex Status Act, which of course ask for the institution to recognize trans and gender diverse people based on their own self-determination. Pardon. So institutions should promote a self-determination based approach to gender recognition, right? Um, the institution should provide recognition for the names and pronouns of individuals who identify um, 
who identify on the LGBTQ spectrum or specifically as trans and gender diverse. The institution should also introduce a special administrative procedure to allow the applications um, to be made for gender markers to be changed. Right? Because very often the institution would say, hey, but we don't have a, a process for that. Um, and so perhaps we don't even have a policy, right? So we're saying, okay, we have a model policy framework that can assist you in getting there quicker. You don't necessarily have to draft your policy framework from scratch, right? Your inclusive policy from scratch. Um, here is a model policy framework that you can adapt to your own context um, and then perhaps have a, an annexure to that to say that here's a special process that can happen for trans and gender diverse persons. Um, it's also creating administrative procedures to affirm gender recognition. Um, and really it's about supporting trans and gender diverse um, students. And then uh, procedures to support the right to a name change um, and the gender marker, to, 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 to change the gender marker. And then procedures to support the right to name change, as well as administrative um, procedures to access a third gender marker options. Um, and then provision of specific and special administrative procedures where need be. So in terms of um, other recommendations, yeah, we're speaking around specific admin um, procedures. We're specifically asking that higher education institution reform administrative procedures, uh, policies and processes to be gender responsive. Um, and here we're speaking around registration forms and online application for enrollment. We're speaking around enrollment procedures, um, student cards, class lists, and module registration, right? Because if we, if we are saying that we are serious about um, acknowledging the existence of trans and gender diverse persons within our institution, then this is really the bare minimum that we can do. So... Um, in terms of communications, we're also saying that impact of the um, protection uh, of POPIA, the Protection of Personal Information Act, um, in, um, official communication on behalf of the institution and digital communication received from service providers must also recognize the person's identity. Because very often the institution would say, let's say for example, um, and we'll touch on that, but let's say for example, um, the CBUT hires out uh, a residence on the other side of this, um, of this area and uh, a human rights violation occurs or discrimination occurs there, they would usually say that, oh, uh, we are not responsible for that. Actually, that is the service provider. It's not us. But this service provider is on your payroll. So what do you mean? So... Pre the prevention of harassment and discrimination. What are we talking about? So introduction of trans inclusive and gender diverse language and concepts into disciplinary frameworks. Um, and then special provisions to, be addre to address discrimination against trans and gender diverse um, students. Um, and here we're speaking around dead naming, um, misgendering, bathroom usage, hate speech. Is it verbal? Is it in writing through digital and social media? Um, assault, physical and sexual assault, how does the institution, how does the institution um, plan to deal with such instances, right, should they occur? Or, like, like always, are trans and gender diverse persons just placed into broad anti-discrimination policies? Yet we know that the discrimination that trans and gender diverse persons are facing is not broad. It is specific to a protected characteristic within um, for that person. So we're saying that disciplinary processes impacting trans and gender diverse students, um, the policy to include recognition of, um, for forms, for forms of physical violence, gender-based violence, intimate partner violence, um, sexual assault, and rape. And yeah, we can speak about corrective rape too. Um, and then these policies should be periodically reviewed um, by a transformation body. And then policy development of institution of institutional disciplinary processes with regards to reporting of crimes. How do I report when I have been assaulted within the institution? And it is not 
Um, this is not far-fetched. I am standing here as a living testimony. I've been a student at UWC as an undergrad. And I was assaulted within the institution on more than one occasion, but the institution didn't act on that. And I'm not trying to throw UWC under the bus, but I am saying that the institution perhaps was not equipped or the institution did not take me serious enough because someone was mentioning or someone says that when trans women specifically um, come out, we don't have the verbiage, we don't have the knowledge, right? We don't have the, the, the language. And so very often we come out and we, we think we're gay, we think we're gay, effeminate gay men. Um, and so perhaps the institution was just like, isn't that what you wanted? Um, in fact, it's a lot of the responses that I received, like, don't you like the attention? Um, and that, of course, uh, is, 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 is far from the truth. Because, again, yeah, I'm, I put this in here. If it's unwanted, it's harassment. And just because I'm trans, just because I'm LGBTQ identifying, doesn't mean that I want attention from every man that looks in my direction. So, um, we're speaking around... Um, okay, let's go on to security um, services. So, facilities should be gender responsive, okay? Um, and security staff is usually one of the biggest perpetrators within the institution. How much time do I have? Seven I've got seven minutes. So, security um, staff is usually one of the biggest perpetrators of violations within the institution, right? Um, and very often the institution doesn't have their own security team, right? They, they, um, they get people outside of the institution to, to perform those duties. Um, and again, that is where the institution would sit back and say, oh, actually it's not us, it's them. Right? Yet, these security teams are on your payroll. You can do something about it. Facilities, we're speaking around disciplinary frameworks regulating prevent, prevention of harassment should be responsive and provide relief, important provide relief um, in instances where harassment or discrimination occurs. And here we're speaking about an, an, a minimum of one gender neutral bathroom should be made available if at all it is not possible, right? Now, I know the issues around A, but you can't have a gender neutral bathroom on the east side and I study on the north side. Yes, we understand that. It is a way for us to say that if the institution inten intention is to start off with one gender neutral bathroom, we can accept that because then it creates a, um, almost a ripple effect for future interventions, right? The institution is then at least willing to start, um, Dr. Vitalesi. Um, and then gender neutral bathroom facilities should be, sorry, the prevention of the use of a gendered bathroom by a trans or gender diverse person may constitute as an act of harassment. So if I go to the bathroom, the female bathroom, and females, like the lecturer that Butelezi, um, Dr. Butelezi was speaking about, um, decides that I don't belong in that bathroom. Um, and I told her that I do belong in this bathroom. And I go back tomorrow and she's also in that bathroom again and she decides to grab me by my collar and said, get out because you make me feel uncomfortable, then that could be constituted as an act of harassment. Um, the prevention, um, sorry, the forceful eviction of a trans and gender diverse student from a gendered bathroom may constitute as an act of unfair discrimination even. Okay? So if someone constantly tells me, I'm not allowed here, it's not your space, you're not supposed to be here, that can constitute harassment. If the person forcefully evict me, call security and the security grab me and throw me out of the bathroom, then that can be constituted as an act of unfair discrimination. We're also speaking around gender affirming health care and other health care services, specifically sexual and reproductive health care that needs to be inclusive of trans, gender diverse, and queer LGBTQ persons within the institution. 
Um, we're also making provision here yeah, or recommendation that where it is not possible, where the institutions say, hey, but we, we already struggling with resources and there is no other facilities that we can create for this insti for, for health um, to access um, inclusive healthcare services, we're then saying that information must be made accessible. And that doesn't cost the institution anything. We're saying that if you're saying that you can't provide gender-affirming health care and sexual reproductive health care that is, uh, that is affirming, then we are saying that the institution should then say, oh, there's actually a WITS RHI clinic, which is a transgender clinic, um, where you can be initiated on HRT in Belleville, and here is their number. It's nothing from the institution, right? It doesn't cost them anything. But we're also asking um, that sensitization training be made available, development of guidelines be um, drafted, and then, of course, IEC materials. Um, and we're asking for special leave of absence uh, to receive gender-affirming healthcare services. So what does that mean? If I have an appointment for my doctor to examine me or to initiate me on HRT, and I have an exam on the ex exact same date, the institution cannot punish me for that, right? The institution cannot penalize me for that. Student housing and accommodation, we've touched extensively on that, so I'm not gonna waste my last few minutes on that. But student housing, like it was recorded in the always on the edge research done by the center, uh, CSANG, and of course the Center for Human Rights, um, and the COP, as well as by Dr. Butalezi, um, speaks extensively on the exclusion that we experience within um, student housing. Um, so how can you get involved? I've thought of a few points of how you, all of you here today, can get involved. It's to promote, to popularize, and advocate for the adoption of the model policy framework, or MPF, if you may, to strengthen current and existing policies, protocols, and guidelines at your institution or other institutions that you might be serving. Um, support and conduct on-campus um, awareness raising and advocacy initiatives with student groups, the Gender Equity Unit, Transformation Unit, um, really important. Collaborate with student organizations perhaps support, strengthen, promote, and make available research like Dr. Butelezi um, in the fields of human rights, uh, democracy, gender equality, gender and sexuality. Also to establish um, support groups within the institution, right? Um, and safe spaces for trans and gender diverse persons to connect and receive assistance and information because very often we find that trans and gender diverse persons doesn't have access to this information. Right? So you are sitting here today, you can take that information into your classroom, into your groups of friends, into other areas that you are serving in the institution. Um, advocate for the integration of trans-inclusive language and practices within institutional policies and procedures. And then provide ongoing monitoring and evaluation to assist the effectiveness of the policy um, implementation. By the way, we are, um, how we're giving this, this muscle, we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, but we are working with, with the, the Commission for Gender Equality. Engage in regular dialogue with trans and gender diverse students and LGBTQ community members to gather feedback and ensure their voices are heard and included in decision-making processes. And I think this was also a strong point from, um, from Dr. Johannes Butelezi. That nothing about us without us is important. And for us, for some of us, it might seem just like another quote and an overused one at that. But really it is nothing about us without us. If people decide to design policy to improve the practice, to improve the structure of the institution, can that be done with the community uh, being consulted? So we're also launching a, an inclusion scorecard that we've designed, that I've designed. Um, and so the launch of the model, the, the scorecard is really created by Gender Dynamics, which was created with, um, in consultation with educational stakeholders in 2023. Um, it's scheduled for launch in June of 2024, hopefully. The aim of the scorecard is um, using the MPF as a basis to evaluate, um, apologies for that, wait 
as a basis to evaluate inclusion in South African higher education institutions. It's an accountability tool, right? Ensuring adherence to constitutional rights of trans and gender diverse persons. Um, it draws insights from the UNDP's inclusion index, global inclusion index, um, and other human rights mechanisms. Um, also, the scorecard functions as a compliance tool for advocacy, transformation investigations, and litigation. Um, we are currently litigating, by the way, uh, with the University of, I don't want to say against, but with the University of, the, univers the University of Free State, um, and we are currently in a court case supporting a trans um, woman that's been excluded from, this, from, from her university, and subsequently had to drop out um, due to, to, the, to the exclusion. Um, and then subsequently, we're also serving as amicus in two basic education court cases um, with, uh, against the Department of Basic Education in the country. And so um, it also provides a roadmap for strategic interventions and promotes accountability, um, facilitates advocacy efforts and progress tracking in partnership with CGE. So CGE and... Um, our beautiful colleague here, um, Sikolile, is going to speak about um, some of the work that they've done with us in the past, but also what they're doing now. Um, and it was really because of that partnership that we were able to uh, strengthen the partnership with CGE um, during uh, Sikolile's uh, reign, if I may. <laughs> and um, so, so the CGE will really help us to give muscle to the model policy framework. So the CGE will then adopt the model policy framework in, um, as well as the inclusion scorecard. And because they conduct transformation hearings annually at higher education institutions, what they will do is to provide the model policy framework to institutions of higher learning to say that this is how you can improve, right? You have 12 months to improve your whatever you need to improve whatever recommendations, whatever their findings found. Here's the model policy framework, and um, based on the, on the scorecard, you should also have a scorecard present. But if the institution is smart enough, they will, they will of course, partner with GDX and say, hey, let's adopt your inclusion scorecard, because then we're saying it's almost like study that for the test to pass the transformation hearing, right? Um, so really, that is um, the strategy that we're thinking around um, giving muscle to both the model policy framework and, of course, the inclusion scorecard. That's it. Thank you. Um, you know, as you were speaking, you reminded me of one of our students, a very passionate activist on this topic, Ukabelo, Kenny Barrel, and I believe he was at the forefront of the model policy framework and he was representing CPUT there. I invited him, them rather, to, to join in on the discussion virtually and watch, but being an activist that Ukabelo is, is currently in court, advocating for something else, and they will watch us later on. But <clears throat> I'm glad, Uguti, the CPUT queer unicorn is also here, because I think this is also a platform and an opportunity for them to network. There's also an opportunity for them as well to gain knowledge and also to share their own lived experiences as the CPUT queer unicorn on campus. And they came at a time whereby there was actually a vacuum, whereby we did not have any LGBTQI plus focused student structures for a very long time. Because there was an attempt to launch one, I think it was in 2015 and 2016. But unfortunately at the time, the idea was not widely welcomed. And as a result, the structure failed. But the new CPUT queer unicorn I've seen, they've been able to tackle it on the horn and they've been running through with it. Um, you know, Kanye Silesi was speaking, I was reminded of something that you said. And I hope, Ukuti, we can get to a point in time 
whereby we don't classify trans people and the entire LGBTQI plus community as a mental illness. Because we still have that persistent thought that is still there even today. And it is backed up by many things, religion, culture, and our own, of course, different lived experiences, because ultimately, we're different people with different perceptions on life, and the way that we all see things is not necessarily gonna be the same. And if we can move away from that and thinking that if someone identifies as trans, that they are mentally disabled or there's an imbalance within their body, I think that could also be a start. And I must applaud the Center for Diversity for also putting a specific focus on trans. Because what we often do is we often speak within the LGBTQI plus body and we often neglect or are silent on trans lives. And whenever we speak of black lives and black lives mattering, we always say that, you know, there is black lives matter, there's the male black life, and then at the bottom of the food chain, there's the woman black life that we're often silent about, about the systematic abuse that women face in all sectors that we can be speaking about. And I think when it comes to trans life, that's how I can be able to put it. Because in as much as there's issues and there's a lot of discrimination and hatred towards the LGBTQI plus community, but there's even a far more greater focus when it comes to trans. And we often don't open up platforms where people can be able to voice out and they can be able to speak. So I think this is definitely a great initiative by the department. And I think we must also acknowledge the work that has been done by the DSA so far in keeping this conversation going. There's many structures within the DSA department that we have, student societies, official departments such as the HIV and AIDS unit, which I know the HIV and AIDS unit, which is led by Ms. Melanie Swenson. They have been leading this discussion for years. I myself, many, many years ago, used to be a peer ed and would go into residences and would educate students on this matter. And that's where you would see that a lot of people are uninformed. And sometimes we need to be able to distinguish between ignorance and just not knowing. And this is why I was saying earlier on, Uguti, when in an institution of higher learning, where debate is something that must take place on a regular basis. And this is where we get to share ideas and we get to learn a lot of things. And in the process, we also get to unlearn a lot of, a lot of things as well. But without wasting any time, um, oh, before I forget, to answer your question on why there was um, you know, genders which are already assigned to people on the register. So the note I got, it said that we used an, R an RSVP system where we had male, female, non-confirming, and other with space where people would um, dot down what they identify as within that space. And that information is the, is the one that was used to filter where you saw male and female. And I must say that also there was blank next to my name. So there was nothing assigned as well. So I think it's, it's, it's a testimony that indeed it was taken from what the audience had um, put inside themselves. And moving on with the program, which there is a slight change though, we are now going to move over to Umpelo who is from the Commission for Gender Equality and is the Provincial Manager for the Western Cape, who will be sharing insights on systematic inequalities in higher, edu in higher education institutions from a gender inequality perspective. After Mpelo is done, we will then have a and a session, which we were meant to have anyhow. And after the question and answer session, which once again I encourage everyone to participate in, we will then break for lunch. So if you have the program in front of you, you will see that after the Q&A session, we were meant to have um, three speakers after that. So what we'll do then is the three speakers that were meant to speak after the Q&A session, they will speak after lunch, which will then also subsequently followed by their own question and answer session. Are we all clear on that? Cool. 
So, before I call Umi Simpelo, allow me to just quickly read her bio. Umi Simpelo has worked as a researcher since 2015. She has worked on issues relating to state mechanisms and systems in addressing gender-related matters such as gender-responsive budgeting, international, legislation, interna international legislative frameworks, public procurement, elections, among others. She holds a Master of Arts in Gender Studies and Law at the School of Oriental Studies, and her interest is in reading through dominant, um, dominant rep repertories of resistance at institutions of higher learning. Mpelo currently works as the provincial manager of the Western Cape at the Commission for Gender Equality. Ladies and gentlemen, let us please welcome Mpelo. Good morning. Am I audible? Okay. Um, hello, uh, my name is Kim Pilu Malibye. I currently work as the provincial manager in the Western Cape province uh, at the Commission for Gender Equality. Uh, thank you very much to CPUT and the Center for Diversity for having us. Uh, and special mention to Stoli Lingovo as well for her uh, introduction uh, to to CPUT. Um, I'm going to have a presentation which is pretty brief and uh, with specific focus on social movements within higher education um, and, the and, the, and the specific focus on labor in social movements uh, as it pertains to gender and how that can be translated um, within state mechanisms, and I think that will be covered as well uh, by you in your work, Kanisile, thank you. So many of you uh, are aware of the Roads Must Fall movement, uh, Fees Must Fall, um, Shackville, Are You Rape List, um, and um, I was part of that movement when I was still in university, and um, there were issues, man, with regards to the movement in higher education and the movement itself, and specific gender-related issues within social movement building, decolonization, um, issues around labor, around gender diversity, and you know, more specifically, uh, just around uh, resistance. Um, this quote is taken by um, one of um, one of the very good feminist writers uh, in her work. Uh, she's now Dr. Tlagavu. And she highlights, so we, black women, fallest women, women like us, are not only on the streets, not only on shutting things down or engaging in direct action or protest. We have also made political investment of writing, filming, and documenting black women's efforts in the fallest movements, because we don't want to fall into the same trap that black women within movements, not only in South Africa, but wider African continent and the diaspora have fallen into, and that is erasure. There are three key illustrations that I want us to draw on within those social movements. Um, the first one is the nude protest at uh, Wits University. Um, during the time of Fees Must Fall, um, when uh, the campus was bombarded um, by police and uh, private security, and I remember on the day specifically, uh, students were tired, there was no water on campus, um, it was hot and we were ducking and diving, grenades, tear gas, and all sorts of things. And um, there were three women um, 
on the campus who decided that they had had enough and uh, we needed to stop what was going on on campus. And the only way that they could do that was that stand between students who were protesting and the police and strip naked. And the use of the body in that sense, right, is crucial in understanding how violence can be disrupted. Um, it was quite jarring and conversation obviously moved away from the protest at the time. Uh, violence sort of subsided at the time. And obviously we know uh, social media moving towards body shaming, et cetera, et cetera. But to, to, at that point, right, to understand the labor that it must take to move into that environment and try and resist and stop that, that pressure of the state um, and of the private security to ensure the safety of students just to allow that that is subsided, right? Those are body, it's bodies of women who are on the front lines of that movement and seldom were they seen. The second illustration will be around um, feeding the movement. Um, at, you know, uh, Vitz as well when, I don't know if you recall, one of the days where um, there was a gathering at Lutuli House, which is not far from Vitz, and um, a lot of students were there as well. So the distribution of water, sustenance for the movement, distribution of fruits, food. Um, in the evenings when buildings were occupied um, at UCT, here at CPUT, UWC as well, um, it was the women who ensured that the movement is physically sustained through the distribution of food, distribution of water, and ensure that uh, meals were prepared for people, right? So that labor is often unrecognized and invisible, and that care work that it takes for the women um, was often not noticed. Then we move to the third illustration, which um, is a trans collective at UCT. And um, there was an exhibition on one day after, you know, the movement has kind of subsided. And um, there was an exhibition by uh, um, some of the students there. And um, if you walked into the exhibition, you saw no images of women um, or trans people or non-binary people or gender fluid people in, in the exhibition, right? And what that means is that it is the face, the movement becomes a face of men and becomes a face of uh, people who are not always visible. Uh, Simam Kele says they were nameless and faceless, right? And to understand that that labor and that documentation um, don't go hand in hand. And um, at that nexus, I, I want us to probably think about and have a conversation about what does it mean to be able to capture labor, invisible labor, all kinds of labor, and document it and ensure the lack of erasure at a high level where the commission works, for example, state level, uh, through the government and through other organizations and collaborations. What does it mean to be able to translate what is happening in social movements, for example, um, and institutionalize that through different areas, policy, legislation, and how well is that implemented? The Commission for Gender Equality, uh, my current employer, is an independent uh, statutory body which is established under Chapter 9 of the Constitution and governed by the CG Act Number 39 of um, to 1996. And part of the work of the organization is divided into three core parts. We have a research unit uh, where I used to work and we have a public information and uh, education unit as well as a, a legal unit. And uh, can you see also alluded to come uh, the work of the the legal unit one of uh, the areas that they focus is to have transformation gender transformation hearings as well as um, employment equity hearings and we have a long history of um, work in the higher education um, sector and we've looked at universities like Stellenbosch, uh, Free State University, UNISA and different TVET colleges as well in KZN um, and across the country. And um, the objectives of those um, investigative hearings and gender transformation hearings are to identify the challenges and progress um, and the big best practices within institutions that comply with EE and related legislation, to ensure that the measures in the workplace are achieved in transformation, and to assess non-compliance uh, by employers. And also now we've extended it to the student population as well as the allocation of budget as it relates to gender transformation. And this is where I think the conversation needs to be had um, for my purposes as the CGE, but I think also with the higher education environment, right? How do you translate labor 
physical unknown, unknow, unrecognized, you can't name them, you can't face them, they don't have faces, how do you translate that into a monitoring uh, and evaluation practice that the CGE can conduct through the legislative hearings and the transformation hearings like we do now, right? And I think, can you see you, you the, 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 the policy framework I think is a, is a good way that the CGE can use to give that meat, right? Is to be able to understand the two state mechanisms and how do we monitor higher education in environments where there are um, legislative uh, frameworks in place, where there are policies in place, where organizations like Gender Dynamics have even gone as far as creating such policy frameworks to ensure that you're able to comply with that and you can be monitored against that, right? How do we ensure that we can hold those those kind of institutions accountable, uh, and, uh, CPUT being one of them. So I think there is a conversation to be had there around uh, theorizing labor, but also practicing what the state mechanisms are to ensure that those practices are adhered to. Um, yeah, thank you very much. will be there shortly, but not now. Um, thank you very much, Mpoh. You know, she said she'll be brief, and I thought a brief would be like 15 minutes or 10, 11, and she said, no, I'll actually be briefer than that. And I thought she was joking, Kanti, she was actually being serious. <laughs> but thank you very much, Mpoh. Um, just a slight comment, you took me back to the Fees Must Fall movement, yes? Um, <laughs> that was a very crazy, chaotic time. And for us who are able to live and be there, I think it's a moment we'll cherish like no other in our student activism days because that was for the first time where students were able to be united beyond their different political affiliations. I remember at CPUT there was two of us who went to go close at UCT when UCT was closing on the day. And afterwards, we came back and we said, at CPUT, we had to be strategic. We did not close at CPUT, because at that time, we were about to be inaugurated into SRC. And we said, Saifuni power, and we don't play with power. So at CPUT, we waited until we were in SRC, and then only after we came back, literally after we came back from Belleville, we went to go burn tires at D6. <laughs> That was how crazy the movement was, and women indeed were at the forefront, even within that movement. And this is where I think the movement, to many of us, it gave birth to new terms, such as radical feminism. It gave birth to a lot of discourse, particularly on gender, and also on trans, and on sexual orientation as well. And of course, women, like you were saying, some are also using their bodies as a, a, a weapon, and you know, I'm a police, a policeman, when they see women naked, they don't, they don't treat, or topless, they don't treat you the same, they run away. And, you know, many things happen during that movement. And I think perhaps maybe if, if one day the role of women within our struggles, not only in a pre-democratic South Africa, but in a post-democratic South Africa in terms of the role that women play in our protest, in our everyday struggles, if perhaps maybe research or something could be done on that because I think that voice is missing. We often are silent on women and whenever we speak of women who are leading, um, you know, revolutionary movements or times, we always reference to Abu Winnie Mandela. We always reference to Abu Princess Mbuya um, Nahanda, Dr. Nkwasa Zana Zuma. And we don't often speak about the heroes of our own time, of our own generation. Perhaps that's something that could be looked into going into the future. But moving forward, we'll now be entering our question and answer session. And for that, I'm going to ask Doc Mpo, okay? Um, if all three of you can please come down and you can have a seat here in front. And what we'll then do is, this is an opportunity for the audience to then engage with you on all that you've presented. 
This is an opportunity for everyone who's in the audience. If you have a question to ask, this is the platform whereby you can ask a question. If you have a comment that you would like to also state, this is also where you can be able to make that comment. So, Doc Mpo um, Kuselo, I'm going to ask, can you see, sorry, I'm going to ask that you guys please come down and we can be able to start our question and answer session. And if possible, you can have a seat right over here. If possible, I'm going to ask that we have a roving mic because I see Ukuti Lena, it's, oh, you've got one, cool, thanks. Um, just to take you back, um, our first speaker, Dr. Johannes Butelezi, he spoke on, um, he shared his research findings on the exclusion of transgender students in institutions of higher learning. Um, he spoke mainly into our residences, which was something which was carried on throughout the conversation. He spoke on um, the everyday life experience of trans students within campuses, but not only in one institution, but in quite a number of institutions. I think he said four, if I'm not mistaken, in his presentation. And then Ukanyi Sile spoke on the model policy framework for the inclusion of trans and gender diverse individuals within higher education. And of course, Umpelo, our last speaker, was sharing insights on systematic inequalities in institutions of higher learning from a gender equality perspective. So what I'll do is I will now open up around, by show of hands, I will note you and a mic will come to you. Please state your name, um, your preferred gender pronoun so that when the speaker makes reference to you, you are not offended in any, in any how. And also please feel free to state your, to ask rather your question or state your comment if you have any comment. I'll start noting hands. Okay, you are number one, number two, number three. Okay, we'll pause there for now. Um, the corner number one. Sure. One, my name is Zikona Plagi. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, my question is to Kanye. Um, you mentioned the inclusion scorecard um, that it will be launching in June. Is it accessible to us as institutions of higher learning um, before the launch, or will, will it be accessible after the launch? I just want to get a sense um, of that. OK, thank you. So what we'll do is we'll first note the questions, and then we'll come back to you, speakers. And then the second question was there. Yeah, it was here in front. Good day, everyone. Yeah. Um, my name is Letsuktsula uh, Ptelezi. My gender pronouns are him, uh, he, him. Um, my question, or uh, I wanted to ask whether, as we were speaking about the 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 the, the, the gender, like the the the, 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 the genders separating the, the, the for instance the bathrooms, or maybe when you're speaking of the members of the LGBTQI to QI community, I wanted to ask if um when they build those um, rooms or bathrooms or rest rooms, do they need, like, they, do they build them in such a way that they separate them? For instance, it's, um, it's for, maybe for this, the, the, the community is divided to like, for instance, there, there are transgenders, there are gays, there are lesbians. So do they separate them as in like, maybe this one is for gays, this one is for gay people, this one is for um, the one that's transgendered or the lesbians, or it's just, one building for everyone. I wanted to be clear on that one. Ngos, Thank you. Ngos. When you said your surname, I saw him smiling. And then I had to make sure to disclaim about we're not related. I was expecting that disclaimer. Um, and then the third question was right here. I come quite not too far from him. 
Um, hello, everyone. It's so loud. <laughs> um, I am Nusipi Kundana. I identify as a she, her. Um, uh, I'm a student, CBT, but I'm also part of the undergraduate um, quality desk at CBT. I'm the chairperson of the desk. I'm here on regards of quality matters of CBT. Um, so as you mentioned that there are lack of, um, as you said, bathrooms for the new show general, as well as issues in um, universities and residences um, for our transgender students. To what extent, may I ask, um, is the possibility of this happening with the current um, issues CPUT is already facing? There's a lot of other students as well that um, not a lot of are receiving accommodation already. Um, and there's a lot of students being sitting outside with coming from external places and they already not placed in residences. Um, and um, like she mentioned as well, um, sorry about this, um, that the students applying, I actually like the idea, when you, on applica applications, that they should identify and should be redirected in a page to be um, um, asked, because that's also another question that I ask in terms of applications. Are students asked um, in terms of disclaimer forms as to, okay, if you are gender neutral, are you accepting or do you understand that we do not have residences that accommodate gender neutral as yet? And are you okay with being with, you know, <laughs> I don't know, how, but I'm trying to explain it. And the other um, issue I wanted to, um, sorry, um, assess with was the, sorry, 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 I don't wanna take time. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, the bathroom issue. Oh, the allocation. You mentioned that you work for the provincial manager. I know that the Center of the Higher Education also works with, um, with universities in terms of funds. So how would the allocation for budget for the gender transformation at CBUT work? What kind of collaboration would be they be? Because we know that obviously funds are needed to build these um, facilities for these students. How would that engage with the CBUT protocols? Thank you. Thank you. So that will be the end for round one, and then we'll open up another round after these questions have been asked, um, have been answered. So to our speakers, we had three questions. The first one was on the scorecard accessibility, then the second one was on gender neutral bathrooms, and then the last one was the possibilities of, impl of implementation as well as the allocation of budget. So I think we'll start with the first question from Uzi Kona on the scorecard accessibility. One, two. Okay. Um, okay, so with regards to the scorecard, the scorecard is not yet available um, to the public. Um, and I think it's, it's also for good reason, um, because at the moment, we first would like for the institution to indicate that they um, have a need or a desire to adopt the model policy framework because to, against what are we going to score the institution, right? Um, if the institution say, hey, so we would like to formally partner with Gender Dynamics or we ad hocly want to work with Gender Dynamics like we've been doing with CPT, then I think it's important to um, first adopt the model, pol explicitly adopt the model policy framework, right? Um, and get acquainted to those recommendations and perhaps try and see to what extent those recommendations can work for you in your context. Because we, we're saying that those are just, those are broad recommendations. Each institution are, is going to have to um, kind of like make their own, their own way through the model policy framework because we understand that there are institutions with limited resources, limited capacity, um, and so many other issues. Some institutions are rural-based, and so we would like to say that institutions should first adopt the model policy framework, and then subsequently the scorecard. Um, and that will then mean that the scorecard will only be able to be um, available post the launch. Cool. I think then the second question on gender neutral bathrooms, I think that question was directed to you, Doc. But it's fine. You go first, then I'll add. Okay. Um, my view on, Shenge, on this question on gender neutral bathrooms. <laughs> Once we create 
different bathrooms for gays, lesbians, and you know, cisgender men, cisgender female, and so on. It's going to cause another chaos. Because my view is, why should we categorize human beings based on their gender or their sexual orientation? So I will make an example of what we did in, in, in my school where I was working as a teacher. We, we didn't build a new bathroom, but we, what we did was we will re remove all the gender markers um, in all bathrooms that we have. That was number one. Number two, we did advocacy. My view is we cannot win the issue of gender neutral bathrooms if we don't learn and learn and relearn about gender and sexuality. So in other words, we don't have to build new bathrooms, but we can teach our students, our, our learners in schools to say, if there's someone who prefers to use this particular bathroom, please do not harass them when they are there. So in other words, that's what we did. So I think I will stop there to say, we don't have to build new bathrooms, but what we can do is, we can use the facilities that we have and turn them into gender neutral bathroom, even if it's one, and, and leave the other ones so that, you know, a transgender individual can have a choice to say, I'm not comfortable to go into these two spaces, but at least I've got a place where I can feel more comfortable. Thank you. Okay, so with regards to bathrooms, I think it's important to note that I agree, I agree with uh, Dr. Butelezi. I also think that with regards to the design of the bathroom, we're really asking for single stalls, not a bathroom that is just open where everyone can watch my body, can see what is between my thighs, and can see how my body looks, whether I'm on hormones or whether I'm not on hormones. Right? Um, so we're asking for single stalls in a bathroom. So even if more than one person goes into the bathroom, even if it is a, um, a gender neutral bathroom, for example, a trans person can feel safe in that cubicle. Right? It's really about how creative can we get around, and creative, in, 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 and then on the flip side is around. Um, innovation and, of course, through a human rights-based approach, right? So a lot of the times, these, the issue around bathrooms, it's not just bathrooms we're speaking about. We're also speaking around, um, for example, um, other facilities like changing rooms for sports people, people who play sports within the institution. Very often they have to quickly change because they have to get onto the game. Where do they do that? Where does a trans person do that? in front of everybody while I'm trying to get out to my next match. So really it's about having single cubicles in terms of the design. I know Dr. Butelezi did answer your question, but in terms of the design, I think in my mind, I would also like to have privacy and confidentiality in a bathroom, whether I'm sharing that bathroom or whether I'm not sharing that bathroom. And Kosi, um, Doc, do you want to add? Um, what you are saying is important. One of our, our participants, um, Ace, he, he, she was mentioning something to do with the, the structure of the bathroom. Um, I'm happy that at CPUT I've seen that structure where there's, there's a space underneath and up there as well it's open. Um, at UJ, we, we, we used to have those bathrooms. But now, remember, if I'm outside and you are inside, um, I can see probably the shoes, probably the color of, of, of whatever that is underneath. Then the, there will be a conversation between us who, who are outside that uh, structure. So, so I do agree with you to say that's another way to deal with it. Let's change the structure of our bathrooms so that everyone can feel safe. Thank you. 
Thanks. And I think the last question was directed to Tom Po on the possibilities of implementation alongside the allocation of budget. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think just to pick up off what you were saying, for example, with regard to budget, right, it doesn't need to be drastic. I know um, there are a lot of budget cuts in different institutions, organizations, etc. cetera, but, um, you know, there's a way in which budgeting can be gender responsive, right, and to seriously take into account what are the needs of the people who the money should be allocated to. There's a way in which uh, the money could be spent or directed in a way that is sensitive to those issues, right? For example, with the bathroom thing, uh, like Dr. Pusileti is talking about, just to have that privacy, right? It doesn't cost too much to just increase the height of the, of the, of the cubicle. Um, to ensure that privacy and confidentiality is considered. And that's a gender issue. Um, that's an issue around sexuality. That's around uh, safety. Um, so I think, you know, if we take seriously that budgets should reflect the needs of the social population wherein that economic contribution is going to be made, it should be taken seriously that... Um, those funds should be directed in that way, for example. So um, the country does have a gender responsive budgeting framework at the moment and the CGE does monitor the implement implementation thereof. It's lagging pretty slowly. And I think um, when the time comes, um, DHIT uh, would have needed to comply with that. And we'll see whether the distribution of those funds to institutions does translate within the individual institutions such as CPUT. Cool. And course, um, if I can just add a comment on that, I think this is not solely the responsibility of the government. And I think it's nice that we also have someone from Gender Dynamics, which is an NGO, because this is where every person and every, you know, private and the, pri the public and the private sector comes together, because everyone has a role to play into this. The government by itself does not have the ability to solve all our problems that we have. And this is where the NGOs, the private sector, they also need to rise up. And in doing so, through that SDG of collaboration, that's how things ultimately can be achieved. And then now we'll open up for another round before we close it. So, if I miss you now, there's not I'm not saying Ukuti there is a possibility for another round. So you might as well use this opportunity while you still can. Oh, I so we'll start with our beloved SRC, uh, the deputy chairperson of this campus that we are in, Ome uh, Tandi. And then you'll be number two, you'll be number three, and you sir will be number four. Didn't miss anyone. Cool, in that order. Okay, um, thank you, Luku. Um, I don't think I need to introduce myself any further, but my name is Tane Gilen Jovu, the Deputy Chairperson of Belleville Campus and currently serving as the Policy and Engagement Officer of CPUT Queer Unicorns. For me, it's not personally a question, but also a comment to the overall um, presentations, um, mostly when we speak about residences. As a person who works in spaces of queer people and the LGBT community, is that queer people do not want to be separated. We don't, we, we don't want residences on our own because once you do that, you give homophobes power over these people. You make them a targeted group within society. So when then you link it to the idea of privacy, it means that within our own institutions, we need to understand privacy for everyone. We need more single rooms for people. We need more spaces that allow for people to be comfortable because we need to make sure that when you build residences and things that make them separated, you, they become more targeted and they become the skeletons or the islands of society, which is something we do not want when we speak about inclusivity. But the most important thing also when you speak about inclusivity, mostly going back into bathrooms, right? Unisex bathrooms are important to everyone because the, uh, the privacy then that you get when you link it to the comments also of sports rooms and etc., is that even people who identify as heterosexual 
now are also having problems. Myself, I am a 22-year-old 20, today. I have developed late compared to other females my age. My breasts are not big as other females. At times, I do feel uncomfortable being around those certain people because of that. And because of people's bodies being different, it is important to have such um, facilities that are, that, are, that, are, that are there to accommodate everyone from different states of life in the way that they are respected, respected and their dignity is upholded. Thank you. Ngozi, Ngozi Tandi, just before you, you speak, just want to also highlight that I'm sure you could pick up when she was speaking that she's actually a debater. Tandi was, um, she's currently the fourth best debating judge in the SADC circuit. So that's the entire Southern African um, developing community or developing district. This is one of the best debating judges in the Southern Hemisphere of the African continent, with an exception to some of North African countries that she also competed against and she was able to be within the top five. So that's one of our celebrated students um, in the institution who is now also leading student politics. Over to you. Uh, hi guys, my name is Abu Zachonas. Um I identify as a he, a him. My question is, um, I don't know who am I going to direct it to, I'm just going to direct it to the entire panel. It's, um, it's with regards to the curriculum. Um, can you see they mentioned that um, they have a, a difficulty when engaging with the Department of Health um, I think it's strictly because that department wi deals with the, um, the, the body's anatomy and everything. So um, what um, are, are the engagements towards transforming um, the curriculum to address the issues of the queer community? That is, when it comes to the health department, their argument is that even if you can dig up bones from 4,000 years ago, you can identify whether they are male or female based on the anatomy of um, the bone structure. So when it comes to changing the curriculum, it means that we must go back firstly to high school life sciences, we must go back to natural sciences and everything. So wh what are the engagements to, 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 to address that? Because this topic, I see that it's mainly based on the social construct of society and gender being defined as a social construct rather than um, being put to a scientific debate because that's what mainly they bring when they come to such debates. Also, I want to understand if um, the policies that are presented here, are they liberal policies or radical transformative policies? For example, if you go to UWC, their residences, unlike ours, we have Freedom Square that stays males only. We have Richard Sago that stays females only. But if you go to UWC, one residence, one corridor, this room is male, the next one is female. I don't know how they use their bathrooms. So when you speak to radical policies, it is to say that, okay, we're tired of this, tomorrow we want to change. If you may maybe take it to the political arena, it's what the EFF is doing in Parliament to say that 80% of white people in South Africa own the land. We want to wake up tomorrow if we are in power and are going to change that. The land is going to be transferred in the hands of the majority of the people. That's radical. But liberal policies say that let's gradually drift from that 80% towards equality. So are these radical, radical policies in a sense that you want tomorrow to wake up um, and change the policies um, to, 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 to what is being presented here or are they liberal policies where maybe we start with going to UWC to benchmark to say that okay let's change Freedom Square this block he be a females, be a males, be a females, be a males then gradually to changing that um, le room be a male, be a female, so that we get comfortable with each other sharing the same space um, and everything. Thank you. And of course, speaker number three. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ayabonga. Good morning. Uh, it's a good day. Good day. <laughs> um, I only want to comment on what has been shared so far. 
Well, I, I do want to express my disappointment on the lecturer that was offensive to the student that was a participant on the doctor's research. Um, but it also is an indication that our universities, um, or in fact all the institutions of higher learning, they need training in terms of staff members, such as your house uh, parents, your security guards, etc., etc. We can have these conversations here, but if then you don't have a security guard attending these conversations, they are not going to be able to empower um, to go on and be able to be the securities that we need or that we require in the 20 in in 2024 in the in the age where we enforcing or advocating for social change and um, inclusive inclusivity. I also want to make mention of the favorite quote because it just came when Udok was talking about how the lecturer was offensive, and this this is a quote that has always been some some of my you know, motivation to go through Indoyo Funda, being an educated young man, and also not only in terms of curriculum, but also outside the society, study the society and, and question things that are so-called normal. And this quote reads as follows, the paradox of education is that as one begins to be educated, one also begins to question the society that educated them. And I was as I've said, I was disappointed by a lecturer. That is someone that you would presume that this person knows things and would be able to act in a way that is educative and also, um, you know, um, inclusive of the students as well. Thank you very much. And go see, and then it's the speaker in front. Thanks, thanks, uh, program director. I am Jacob uh, from the Arrestes Department. Uh, I think, f f firstly, le let me deal with this statement, learn, relearn, and learn. Uh, uh, it's, it's uh, for us who are, maybe uh, who have uh, some cultural blockage, uh, we might do all those things, and still there won't be a change. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, it might it might warrant what, what I is saying here, to say uh, some of these people with uh, some cultural blockage uh, needs to be in these sessions. Uh, so that they are able uh, to learn, relearn, and unlearn. Uh, the drastic part that was spoken about, I, I have it here to say, if you are to say uh, toilets or bathrooms should be changed, that, that's drastic. Uh, to say, when I go out here now, uh, I'll be sharing uh, the same bathroom uh, with, 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 with the president, of which is something that, again, culturally, I have a problem with. Therefore, there is a lot that we need to do uh, 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 for us to be able to address this issue. Uh, what was said here again was a, a trans and gender. For me, who does not understand, uh, uh, and the other thing that was said here, some will say, I identify as he, identify as she. I don't know anything about that. Therefore, there is a lot that needs to be done to people who are uh, less informed uh, about transformation in relation to uh, gender equality, in relation to your own biological space and so forth. Therefore, one will want to say these sessions will take place uh, continuously in different platforms, uh, maybe to some of us uh, who are from the residents' parents' point of view, to understand that having Freedom Square that is male, uh, male dominated, uh, that in itself is dis dis discriminatory uh, to a female, uh, to, to a queer, and so forth and so forth. Therefore, I just wanted to say uh, education and education is important for us to be able uh, to understand that we are living in the 21st century. Thanks, uh, Program Director. And goes. Um, I'm not going to direct what was said to anyone, but I'll allow um, speakers to respond because I saw good you guys were writing down questions. But the first one, we had a comment from Tandi who was speaking on, it was mo a comment on how queers are not necessarily asking for segregation because that would lead to a much more bigger struggle and also to the increase in homophobia. And the second one was from Avuza, who was speaking on the curriculum and how there needs to be engagement on the transforming the curriculum and questions around that. And also asking on liberal and radical policies and where do we, within what was presented, fall. And then we also had a comment from Ayabonga, who was speaking on personnel training and how we need to be more inclusive 
in these conversations that we had, which was also seconded by Udadu Jacob, whereby let these conversations not be limited to specific individuals, students, formal staff members, academics, but let it be open to everyone, the security members, um, cluster, the safety and security personnel, everyone who is part and parcel, whom we would regard as a staff member of the institution, they should be invited to such spaces, particularly where such conversations are taking place. And then lastly, there was um, a question on, or rather concern on the terminology and how we often overlook terminology and we tend to think that everyone understands when we speak of orientation, when we speak of gender, when we speak of gender pronouns, um, when we speak of the LGBT2+, what does that mean? We tend to be under the perception that because we understand and know it, that everyone else does, and there's actually room for education there, which is also a continuous learning, which will involve, like you were saying, a lot of unlearning and relearning and getting equipped with what's currently happening out there. So, like I said, I'm not going to ask anyone because the questions, I think, they were much more directed to everyone more than a specific individual. So feel free to answer or comment on any of those that you're comfortable with. You can go ahead. Okay, I'll go first. Um, I think I'll comment on two issues. Uh, Tandegile's one first around um, integration uh, rather than segregation. I think just from an, uh, a strategy point of view, um, sometimes integration is the ultimate goal, right? But you might need to take it through segregation, right? As in, it is a means to an end. So I think we need to also think around um, what would be the best approach to reach the ultimate goal and sometimes segregation, not necessarily in this context, uh, like a residence or a toilet or et cetera, but sometimes when we approach issues, whatever they are, we need to think about what would be the best strategy going forward to ultimately achieve that goal. So I think, I, I think, I think it's an important part that you, that you, an important issue that you raised there. Secondly, um, uh, Mr. Jonas, on the curriculum um, and uh, epistemic violence, that's what Spiva calls it. Um, and the, centrally, the centralization of certain voices, the upliftment of certain voices and theories and understandings and approaches. And the positivistic one within the biological sciences one has always been an issue of contention. That is the supposed true science, right? And the relegation of uh, social constructions and other ideologies around approaching the physical body, right? So we need to think a little bit around what voices do we elevate uh, when it comes to biological sciences and which ones do we sideline? And um, um, yeah, thinking around, you know, decolonization ultimately is that um, the, department, the departments of health and the sciences uh, more broadly should not be exempt from taking social constructions into consideration because they live in a world, yes, of a physical world, but they are not exempt from the social world that we find ourselves in. So we need to find a way to decolonize that as well and to find balance in those approaches. Um, on the liberal and radical policies, I think I'll pass that on to someone else. Okay, so I think personally, as it pertains to the curriculum, um, I think we are currently busy with the curriculum review, um, curriculum review process, specifically for standard uh, disciplines, right? Um, professional disciplines within the institution. And for those who might not know what um, standard uh, professional disciplines are, is basically if you are uh, getting a degree from an institution, but you are going to practice outside the institution, then there are bodies regulating even that, right? And so you need to meet those standards as well. So for example, in the Faculty of Health Sciences, I believe um, it would be um, HPCC, thank you. Um, and they would then say, okay, so this is the standard that we need you to perform at, or the standard that you need to um, kind of like pass in order for you to be qualified as a medical pr um, practitioner, right? And so we are reviewing five of uh, five courses, and that is education law, um, health sciences, 
um, social, social work and, and engineering. Um, and so those five courses are now being reviewed for UCT. Um, and UCT invested in this project. Now, where, if I go back to where that started from, then I can maybe latch on to what Dr. Bitalesi said around learning, unlearning, and relearning, right? Um, in 2021, in the last quarter of 2021, the, the, vice chan the then vice chancellor of the institution, uh, she's no longer with the institution, um, had a, uh, an Instagram live. Um, online with another medical pro prof professional. Um, I believe she's an endocrinologist or, or a surgeon from um, Baragwanath Hospital. Um, and they basically discussed around the title of the theme of this um, online discussion was um, what does science say about LGBTQ people? And they went on to discuss in intersex genital mutilation, what we also known as what is also known as IgM. And they basically condoned um, intersex genital mutilation. And so some of you might not know, but that is, of course, a gross violation of a person's body and the fact that the person doesn't have the bodily autonomy to decide at this, uh, when they are born what they, who they are. And so the, they, they went on to discuss this conversation and, um, and there was a lot of uproar in, in our sector and specifically as it pertains to um, the, the university. Um, and the head of the university at the time. And so Gender Dynamics, um, being a pan-Africanist feminist organization, believes in the values of learning, unlearning, and relearning. Um, we decided to work with the institution, right? In kind of like getting a sense as to where does your information come from? Who did you consult? And how did you get to have an Instagram live with a almost 20,000 people, um, and then sharing this disinformation. And through that project, right, so easily, it could have been easy for us to just say, hey, so everybody in the sector doesn't really want to work with UCT, because UCT seems to be um, saying more than what they are doing, right? Or they saying, okay, we'll, we'll fund this, or we'll do this, similar to our provincial government, who would say, okay, we'll paint a boardwalk in queer colors or the, or the, the, the flag, the queer flag, um, and we'll say that we support trans issues and LGBTQ issues. But where it really matters, which is in policy, we don't, we don't adopt. Right? If we're looking at the hate crimes, the combating of hate crimes and hate speech bill, the provincial government refused to adopt it. Right? Yet, we experience hate crimes and murder of LGBTQ bodies and specifically trans, black trans women's bodies on a daily basis in the country. So, the, looking back at that, so that gave us the opportunity to, um, for the in, to challenge the institution to constitute a, a panel, what we call an LGBTQ review panel, right? That needed to work with this vice chancellor and saying that what you did was wrong and how can we then improve from there, right? It's easy for us to say, for many of us at least, to say, hey, you've offended me, you are out, you're done. There's no coming back for you, cancel culture. But we then said that, you know what, we would like to work with this institution and maybe um, this vice chancellor specifically had, you know, misinformation or she just didn't do enough consultations, which of course what is what the report found. Um, but it also opened up opportunity for us to review their curriculum. And so currently we are busy with that process. Um, is there backlash within the institution from certain parties? Yes, there are. Um, but again, curriculum is important because it is there where you can identify diversity and the diverse nature of the, 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 the patients or the clients that you will be seeing, that you will be servicing. Right? Whether it is through education in the classroom or whether it is through health in, um, in your practice, whether it is as a lawyer, you are going to encounter people of diverse backgrounds um, and specifically speaking around gender and sexual diversity. So again, I think um, health sciences is of course what the anti-gender movement would be using um, to say that we are trying to change what God 
has created, right? And talking about um, biology and anatomy and so on. But it really is about respecting the person for who they are. It's really about saying that if I can be represented in the curriculum, then at least my lecturer will understand me. Then at least my teacher will understand that there are people on, uh, that, that there's more than just the binary. Right? And so how do I show up understanding that there's more than the binary that I will be servicing, especially if I'm going to be servicing um, society? If you are sitting behind a desk and you don't need to service um, communities, then perhaps it's okay for you not to, to care. But if you are going to be outward facing and support communities, then what communities are you supporting? Because you, can, you can't decide who walks through your door, especially if you're a doctor, especially if you're a doctor in a public system, right? Um, and so you would even find that there's still an issue even within UCT, for example, where the Faculty of Health Science, a, a dean within the Faculty of Health Sciences said that they are able to cure queerness, that people can bring their children, if they suspect that they are queer, that they can be converted and they can do that for them. This is the same institution that we're supporting with the curriculum review process. So again, it's about how serious is the institution, and I, I don't want to use UCT necessarily as an example, but I want to say that even if we do um, provide the framework that we think is inclusive, because we hired um, a number of consultants to support us um, in this regard, if we, if we do recommend to the institution, this is how the curriculum should look. It's almost like the model policy framework. It is a model for the institution to adopt and to what extent, right? You must understand that institutions also have their own identity. And the Department of Higher Education is primarily responsible for providing that level of agency to institutions of learning, whether that is schools or higher education, right? Because that needs to be regulated at the, you know, at, at the, at the um, departmental level. Um, so, yeah, I think with regards to, to that, it's, it's an upward battle um, and it really is about whether the institution is serious about change and serious about raising voices, like um, Pelo said, raising voices of those whose voices have been silenced systematically. Um, <laughs> Tandi. I, I'm not debating with you because probably I will lose. <laughs> um, but you are raising an important fact to say once we separate, we are creating another, we are opening another can of worm, you know. Um, but I just want to say to you, you from my study, what we discovered was uh, trust gender students, they, yes, they don't want separate accommodations, but they want to have options. That's what basically they want uh, to say. For instance, if I report the matter to say I'm, I'm staying with this roommate, they don't understand who I am, um, their request is can the institution do something about it? Can they probably give them another room with another, you know, individual who will understand who they are. Um, then I will also go to the issue of curriculum transformation. I've, I've my, one of my students is here. Um, and I need to be careful when I answer this. In my, in my view, Yes, we need to decolonize the curriculum and so on. But because I'm training educators, I'm training students to become educators, as soon as we concentrate on other external factors and we forget about us as teachers, lecturers, or as human beings in general, we're not going to win this battle of inclusive, inclusivity because we'll always blame the next thing that is in front of us. For instance, in, in education, educators, you know, we've got says that governs the behavior of, of educators. Um, so if you violate the human rights of, of your learners, for instance, you are also violating the, the says protocol. And I believe that, like you said, with other health sciences as well, um, there are other protocols that needs to be observed. So 
my, my understanding of curriculum uh, transformation or decolonizing the curriculum, we can do that, but what we need to understand is we need to treat individuals in, in our classroom to say we respect the, their human rights. Because we can transform the, the curriculum, but if we don't appreciate those human rights in, in our classrooms, the, the curriculum won't do anything. That's my view, though. Um, then the other thing, um, Dr. Jacob, I want to talk about what you were saying, to say um, the information, it's somewhere up there, but it does not go to the ground. You know, I'm, I'm at this stage uh, where I'm struggling to find who I am within this academia space. Because I don't want to do research, then the research is presented to academics, then it, it shelved somewhere, then I, I write another paper, same thing, I write another paper. Sometimes I even, you know, when I read some of my papers, I'm like, I've read this thing before, only to find out that I'm the one who have written the same thing. Because it's there. So what I'm trying to say is we, we, we also need to transform how we as academics do our work in, in a sense that we cannot reproduce whatever that we have done before, but we don't go to the ground. Uh, when you read those academic uh, uh, um, uh, articles, the language there is quite difficult for a layman, for instance. So. Uh, those are some of the things that we need to think about if we want to change this particular space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. I also just wanted to add oh. that you mentioned that gender dynamics, for example, and other organizations who's to come forth and, and, and help with, with the work, right? Help government. I think very often you find that there's, there's, there's an issue of government taking many steps back and saying that it is not necessarily um, important, it's not on our policy agendas for now, because that's not the main issue here, right? We have issues of poverty, we have issues of, um, you know, other issues in the country, overarching issues. Um, and so very often you find that government takes steps back and then say, okay, institution, um, NGOs and NPOs in the country can take up that burden. And so we feel very often that that burden becomes heavy, becomes so much that um, there's not even buy-in from government, even though we're resourcing our own activities, we are working tirelessly to advance government's work. That should be government's work. I think uh, that, that's worthy to note here. Come Nandi, there's someone from the government right next to you. I know. And we we'll are still over. be partners. <laughs> so it's very nice that you're saying that. Um, thank you very much to everyone who participated in this session. We will be closing it now and we will be breaking for lunch. The time now is nine minutes to one. I'm going to ask that by quarter past one, may we please all come back. I'll call this our plenary session room to where we are, and we continue off with the rest of the session. Thank you very much to everyone who participated in the session. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for those who sticked throughout and were here. Thank you to the panelists for your presentations and as well as sticking it out for the question and answer session as well. Um, we will be breaking for lunch. Lunch is we will be exiting the same way we came through, where we grabbed our morning snacks, that's exactly where we'll also be getting lunch. So remember, at quarter past one, let us all please be back for the continuation of the program. Thank you very much. Asking for a round of applause.
Stuhl ist hier. Sitzt du gleich hier, Sarah? Ja. Am I the server? No. <laughs> no. O Juliana e Loba tem que me enganar lá só longe.
No, no, I'm not going to. You can just put to the. Very odd. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I think we are going to start with the afternoon session. So if you know anyone who's still out there, can you just send them a WhatsApp? <laughs> Let them know that we are starting. Uh, we are going to have a bit of a packed session this afternoon. Um, my name is Koli Lengobo. I am going to be uh, helping with facilitation this afternoon. Um, I think it's important for us to um, actually be recognize that the topic that we are here to discuss today is really very important because it really touches on um, the experience that students will live with from a university or from a college. So um, I just want to foreground my facilitation this afternoon with some few observations. Um, I'm just buying time for people to come in as well. Um, so I, I, when I was listening, what was very um, clear to me was there are pockets of policies that cater for the accommodation of trans persons. But what seems to be a bit unclear and sure is the implementation and also the various responsive practices that uh, re will result in proper, meaningful inclusion and belonging for students and staff within an institution. And for me, that was very important because if it's not done, then it, 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 it lends its way as a form of violence of some sort. And, and so how do we then work, for, work, work to ensure that such nuances of violence don't continue to take place in an institution of higher learning such as this one? But also, it, it also made me make a very direct link to the National uh, Strategic Planning for Gender-Based Violence and Femicide, which is very clear in its vision. It says um, there is a vision for a South Africa free from GBV, particularly that one directed at women, children, LGBTQIA plus persons. And I think um, we've been really circling around that discussion. But what I also want to highlight is that within the higher education system, 
there is a policy framework on uh, addressing GPV in post-school education and training systems, but there's also even guidelines around um, a, a, a looking at um, SGPV-related misconduct within the S PSET sector. So we are not speaking in a vacuum, but I think there are things that are not done in a way that when I experience something, I'm actually protected. So that's how I would want us to enter this afternoon discussion. But being mindful that the morning session has actually helped us set the scene, uh, also helped us understand what is missing. Uh, you could hear from the, from, from, from the presentation from Kainsil, what are the gaps that still are still there. But you could also hear from the presentation by Dr. Tabtelis that the reality is real. <laughs> um, no matter how many researches can be done, as long as that research doesn't infiltrate into changing policies and practices and human behavior, it's not going to help any one of us. And then lastly, Mpelo tried to actually show us that it's not a once-off. So even when the CGE does an investigation, they must be followed through in terms of the implementation of their recommendations so that then the environment gets changed. So this afternoon, we are then going to build on that process and get an international perspective um, from the two um, uh, uh, visitors and guests that have come all the way to be with us today. So the session this afternoon will go this way. I am going to ask all the five uh, presenters for this afternoon to come and join us, but I will invite them in because I also want to acknowledge and also ensure that they come here and knowing that we've acknowledged them, they are here. So I'm going to start with um, Jessica and, uh, and Debbie. Probably I'll start with Debbie because it's here. Uh, I will read and then you will come up. Um, so, Debbie Jackson, um, a transgender advocate, um, and the topic that's of interest is on international perspective, diversity, inclusion, and a sense of belonging for all in higher education institution. Jackie, Jake, Debbie Jackson is an advocate, speaker, trainer, and a parent of a transgender child. She shares her family story with the hope of helping other trans youth feel seen and helping families move beyond fear towards acceptance and celebration. Her empathy, dedication, and unwavering commitment to, quality, to equality have made her a respected and influential figure in the movement for transgender rights through speaking engagements, workshops, and media appearances. In her work, she touches on themes such as family acceptance, matters of faith, education, youth health care, and the impact of legislative uh, policy. So Debbie, come, come ahead. And then we can give her a hand. Uh, because of the nature of their uh, conversation, uh, Jessica will also join. And Jessica, yours uh, is, 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 is tricky for me. I want to pick one uh, aspect. Um, so it says, a little about me. When I finally and fully transitioned in 2010 at the age of 45, it was, um, it was the culmination of a significant part of a life journey, which I had started in my own mind with my own self-awareness on my own at the age of four. My name is Jessica Lynn. I'm a transgender woman, originally from California. I now live in Thamesworth in the West Midlands, England. When I was a child, the term gender dysphoria had not been identified or labeled. Even today, the definition and the understanding contributes, continues to evolve. And I want to leave it there, because the rest is what she will be talking about. <laughs> um, and then I also want to bring for the local um, context again, I want to ask uh, Juliana from the Triangle Project to come join us in front 
And while I read the biography as well, um, there. Um, the Triangle Project's education trainer, so Juliana, that's the role she performs daily. Um, the topic will be inclusion as well uh, on diverse student and staff in South Africa higher education institution. Juliana is an experienced researcher and social justice activist, a master's degree candidate with an honors degree in um, women's and gender studies from the University of the Western Cape. She has proven a track record in networking, building, and community services. Juliana com Juliana's commitment to advancing social justice is evident in her impactful contribution to the various causes, reflecting a passion of creating, for creating a more equitable, inclusive society. She has pioneered and steered the creation, creating inclusive and affirming school education spaces, CISA project, under the Community Engagement and Empowerment Program, CEEP, and strives for inclusive society. Employing an intersectional feminist approach, it focuses on fostering diversity, equity, inclusion in education, and ensuring all individuals can access education and fulfill their potential. And welcome on stage, Juliana. And then um, we will then have the two um, other presenters who will more be giving us a context in terms of a uh, student's life. Sinelizwe Nojigila, who is the president of the Student Representative Council. Uh, student and Voices will be sharing experiences and exploring possible solutions for the future. Sanelizwe Nojigila was born and raised in a small village called Osborne in Monfre, Eastern Cape, uh, I, I, and I'm reading in first person now. I identify myself as a distinguished individual who has carved her path towards academic excellence and leadership. At the age of 27, she believes it is perseverance and determination that has amplified the qualities that have propelled her towards a notable achievement. Currently pursuing a master's in operations management, she has dedicated herself to, persuade, to, to the pursuits of knowledge and expertise in the field. Her academic journey has been a reflection of commitment to intellectual growth and desire to contribute meaningfully to the realm of operations man management. She's a trailblazer who has recently be made history by becoming the first of many female presidents of the CSR, CSRC at CPUT. It is her belief that this milestone does not only speak volumes about her leadership or capabilities, but also marks a significant moment in the institutional institution's history. And I guess as the first, we really have to clap because a lot lies in your shoulders. <laughs> and then one of the last speakers will then be um, Simamkelo, Sim Sim Simamkele Mabikana, MX Simamkele Mabikana, uh, CPUT Queer Unicorns Acting Secretary. Um, and we'll be sharing around student voices and sharing experiences. Simamgelo, sim, uh, my Zulu shame, sorry. It's as if I just arrived from Guazulu, my apologies. <laughs> Simamgele, mbi mapikana, he or he, he and him is a clothing and textile technology student at CPT, CPUT who is currently serving as a secretary for the CPUT Queer Unicorns. He is a gender activist, queer trans, and diverse student voice in the institution and outside. He believes that change can be also influenced from the bottom. 
Simam Gele is super passionate when it comes to sports and youth development. He believes that talents should not be aligned to gender, but everyone must be afforded some opportunity and support adequately regardless of their gender, of, of their identity, sexuality, and whom they associate with. With those, can we welcome Simam Gele? So we are going to ask um, Debbie to come first. Uh, yes, to speak first. So they will, they will be speaking as a panel rather than, than only Julian has a presentation to, to show, but they will speak. And then after they've all presented, we then open it up to plenary. But I also, as a facilitator, have some of the probing questions if I see that you guys are dololo sleeping, I will try and help you wake up. I know with such wonderful food, with all the proteins that we just had, some of us will start dozing off. But I don't think we should because this is a really exciting uh, conversation that we are having and uh, no one should be left behind and not hear what has happened. So as you are seated, that's how you will speak. I'm not going to interrupt in between, but all of you know your time. But I'll be sitting there and I will show you if your time is up. <laughs> okay, over to the speakers. <coughs> Thank you, everyone, for um, having us all here today and for being here and being awake, <laughs> she said after lunch. Um, my name is Debbie. My pronouns are she, her. And um, I do want to say one thing. It, it lists me as a transgender advocate, and I want to make sure everyone knows I am not transgender. I'm a transgender rights advocate. I advocate for trans youth, um, and I want to make sure we're very clear on that because I don't pretend to speak for trans people. I just speak about my family's experiences and other families. Um, you might tell from my accent that I do not come from here. <laughs> All of you speak so lovely. I love the way you say curriculum. I say curriculum because I come from Alabama in the United States. Um, recently, we lived in Missouri in the very center of the country. And the reason that I became an advocate for trans youth is because my now 16-year-old non-binary child socially transitioned at the age of four. And when my child was supposed to enter school at the age of five, um, their identity was not going to be respected. They would be forced to wear a uniform and use the restroom and other facilities in the gender uh, that they had been assigned at birth. So. Um, instead of putting my child through that, I left my job and started teaching my children at home. So we were a homeschool family. And I decided I wanted to start working with schools so that other families wouldn't have that same experience. And a lot of times you find it's easier to advocate for other people rather than yourself, especially when it's your child, because it's so deeply personal and emotional that it's really hard to stay calm in really important moments when you have to advocate for your child. But I also, over the next few years, started using my background in communications and marketing to work with LGBTQ organizations in the United States and was able to become a family advocate for them. And through that work, I was able to work with the National Education Association and start working directly with edu educators in the US about our experiences and what the laws were and what the rights of trans students were and what they needed in schools and from the school system. That was a dozen years ago, and things were going really well in the US. We had a really good president for a while who started speaking about transgender people about, and, and made policy changes that protected trans youth and said it publicly, trans youth are protected in schools. And that is what led to a backlash. And it's a backlash that we are experiencing now um, so badly that my family left the country six months ago uh, so that we would be able to find some peace and solace for my child. Part of that is because being public advocates puts kind of the crosshairs on you. <laughs> and um, my child has been targeted and used by politicians in the US 
in some really egregious ways, um, disrespecting their identity, and we didn't want them to have to live through that during this year's presidential election in the US. But I wanted to talk a little bit with you about the experiences um, of students who are in higher education, really all education in the US, and specifically to some of the legislation that we are seeing. The more I hear presentations during our time here about the South African Constitution, the more jealous I am of what you have in front of you on paper and the rights that are enshrined in that document. And I know there's a vast difference between what's on paper and the lived realities. But for us in the US, for a long time, we didn't have anything enshrined. It was assumed, it was debated. And we started seeing progress when people said, yes, absolutely trans people, trans students have rights. And now instead of putting that into tangible legislation, enumerating that into law, we have the opposite happening. So six years ago, there were maybe 20 anti-LGBTQ bills presented in the 50 different legislatures across our country, in the 50 different states. Within two years, that number had increased to more than 200. And just this last year, we had more than 500. And the vast majority of those were targeting trans people and trans students directly. Some of the bills that have been um, put forward started with bathroom bills to legislate where people pee, to force people to show an identification in order to have access to a bathroom in a public accommodation space such as a school. That didn't go over very well. People thought it was a horrible invasion of privacy and no one wanted to have their gender question to use the restroom, so only one of those bills passed in the United States in 2016, I believe. It was repealed less than a year later because of the outrage. So the bathroom bills didn't work. So then they decided that they needed to start putting in religious exclusions. If you had a deeply held religious belief, whether it was actually based in religion or it was just your personal moral belief, you could discriminate against an LGBTQ person. That didn't get very far. So then they decided that parents like myself who had gone and fought against bathroom bills were a little bit too effective in stopping some of this legislation when we were talking about the damage it would do to our kids. So they decided that they would make it a felony to support your transgender child. So for several years, I have had to go to my state capital and beg and plead legislators not to turn me into a felon and make me go to prison because I supported my transgender child. They decided it wasn't really a good look to attack parents for loving their children, so then they decided that they would go after the medical providers, the healthcare providers, the psychologists who were supporting families and make them the bad guys and make parents the victims of those bad guys. So they started attacking the healthcare and access to healthcare. Then they decided that they should also call teachers and educators pedophiles and groomers for supporting trans students because they needed to make sure that if a child was supported at home, they didn't have access to public safe spaces as well. So we have, in the last two or three years, seen a lot of anti-LGBTQ legislation that's aimed specifically at the education sector. Um, just took notes on this year, we have 484 anti-LGBTQ bills that target students and educators. Many of those are about free speech and expressions. We call them don't say gay bills because if you talk about being LGBTQ, or if you talk about LGBT people existing in your classroom setting, you can be fined, you could potentially lose your teaching license. We have book bans literal book bans. They didn't learn in previous years that banning books normally means you're a bad person <laughs> um, and you're tyrannical. So they are now banning books if they have LGBTQ characters, 
if they have LGBTQ themes, and they're banning a lot of books based on race. So if the main character is black, they want to ban those in half the states in the United States. Curriculum bans, LGBTQ inclusive curriculum, we have a handful of states, I think eight at the moment, that mandate that they actually teach about LGBTQ people, but the rest of the states would like to say that they cannot teach about those issues. We have public accommodation bans, which is bathrooms, locker rooms, changing areas. They are restricting transgender students from participating in sports because they say there's some great unfair competitive advantage, even for five-year-olds. We now have bills where they are forcing teachers to out their transgender students. If a student requests a new name or a different pronoun from the teacher, that teacher will be required by law to immediately call the family and alert them, even though the child is probably talking to the teacher rather than their parents because they know it's not safe at home. We have identification restrictions. So even in places where you've been able to legally update your identification on your birth certificate, on a driver's license, or in a state ID, they are now banning those and retroactively um, saying that your identification is no longer valid and they're sending in you a new one. Um, in places like Florida, if you are uh, reissued your identification with your previous gender marker on it, and you are ever pulled over, questioned by police, and they see the um, no longer valid one that it has expired, you could be arrested for committing identity fraud. And we have religious exclusions again um, for any teacher who does not respect a trans person's existence, they cannot be forced to use that person's pronouns if they have a moral objection to it. And in some states, like my state uh, of Missouri, they are actually making it illegal for an educator to use a trans person's correct pronouns because they say that it is aiding in the transition of a child, which would be a felony. So. The state of affairs in the United States, especially in education right now, is really um, frightening. And Jessica will talk more about experiences of traveling around and speaking to students in schools. The one thing that I can say uh, is a positive is that students do not take kindly <laughs> to their um, institutions of learning, especially higher ed, being taken over in this way. Um, we have a lot of protests, Americans like to protest, and we do have a lot of protests on campus, um, creative protests, and um, there is a lot of pushback to these new uh, legislative restrictions that are being passed across the country. Um, there are lists, social media is used a lot, just public information campaigns. They have what's called the shame list, which is where they name public institutions that have requested a religious exemption by the government so that they can allow LGBTQ discrimination, um, so that they can have religious organizations on campus that are able to exclude um, LGBTQ students, um, so that their housing can be exclusionary for LGBTQ students who are asking for privacy and accommodations. Um, so. Again, um, I want to allow more people to focus here on the positive and the good things and the changes that you need to see in your country rather than come in and, and talk about the doom and gloom that is the United States. But um, I, I think it's important for you to see that even in light of all of this, um, trans people in the United States are resilient and they are saying they're going to fight back. They're not going to go back into the closet. Once you have protections, you have a taste of access and freedom and that you can express your joy. And that's what it is, is the trans joy um, from being able to, to be yourself. It's really hard to take that away and not have people protest and push back and fight back. So, um, there is hope on the horizon. It might take a generation or two, but as you move forward with your own fights for equality, just know that wh where I come from, 
having a center for diversity, equity, and inclusion would be a problem. They are actually trying to take DEI initiatives out. Um, I, I read you some of the things that are happening at the state level, at the federal level. We also have legislators who are trying to, when they pass appropriations bills, so budgets for the government, deny money to colleges and universities if they offer gender affirming care in their health care clinics, if they um, if they investigate people or organizations that define sex in a way that excludes trans people. So if you have an organization on campus that is trying to exclude trans people and you want to have the government investigate that for a discrimination or harassment case, they might take away your funding to your university just for investigating that kind of harassment and discrimination. Um, and it also would prevent any funds being used to sue a state or local government over any laws relating to trans people. So your, your government passes a law, your state law, that you're not allowed to use the restrooms. You no longer have the right to sue to try to fight that. Um, so these are just some of the things that are happening. Um, the pushback is strong. But as you move forward, keep in mind, please, that um, you have strength in your constitution quote it, cite it, know what it is, and use those words to your advantage to push for equity. Okay, I have nowhere to be, I have no idea where to begin today. The, the earlier speakers took up all my talk, and so I'm just kind of going to kind of wing it and go through a little bit today. My name is Jessica Lynn. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am a 59-year-old transgender woman, originally from California. I do live in England, and like Debbie, I left the United States because of the discrimination. A little bit more about me, as she said, I knew at the age of four that I sunder, suffered with gender dysphoria. I was born in 1965. That was the year the term transgender was coined. We did not have social media. I did not understand it. I felt like I was the only person on planet Earth that felt that I wanted to live the opposite gender. That did not make sense to a four, five, six-year-old child, and it tortured me. When I was seven years old, and I learned the difference between boys and girls, that boys have a penis, girls haven't. I took a razor blade to my penis to try to remove it, not understanding. That was in 19, you know, 1969, 1970. It did not make sense. 1971, it tortured me. So I lived the life of a fake life. I used coping mechanisms. I played soccer. I did different things, and I did things to stop me thinking. I turned to drugs, alcohol, and I lived the phony, fake life of who I was. I later got married. As to somebody that said that they fully accept me, we did not understand. She got pregnant, I married her, I will transition later in life. You know, we discussed this, we had a conversation about this. We married, had three children, could not be there, it dissolved. I finally said I had to live my life. With her help, she said, I will help you, I will work with you. So we started making arrangements, I, we divorced, I put her through medical school while I started planning my transition. And she said, you have my full 100% support. So at 45 years old, I went through my John Deere confirmation surgery and I started living my life truthfully. Well, she didn't support me. She went on about two years after I had my surgeries, after I did my transition, and she said, F you, filed a restraining order with the state of Texas. I went into court and said, I have full legal physical custody of all three boys, and the judge said I did not care. And from right then and there, he ordered me to have a psychiatric evaluation done by a right-wing theology professor that came back and said, I am the better parent. And in June of 2013, the judge did not accept it. And in June of 2013, the judge stripped all of my parental rights to my then 13-year-old little boy. He said, I'm never allowed to see him, never allowed to call him, never allowed to send him a postcard, a Christmas card, ever. Later that year, on Christmas Eve, I received a letter from the state of Texas that the same mother, the judge, went and had my name taken off my child's birth certificate for being transgender. It turns out that that was the first and only time in US history that that had ever happened. My case went all to the top of the courts in the United States, and they came back and they said, there's not much you can do about it. 
but use your story to help educate the world about what it means to be transgender, which is what I started doing. I started speaking at community colleges, high schools, churches across California. And I found with the universities, this is the best way to educate. You guys, you are the next teachers. You are the next doctors. You still have open minds. You are the ones that are going to change the world. Most of you are going to become parents. You're going to have a child, a sister, a brother, an aunt, an uncle that says, I'm not comfortable being a boy. I'm not comfortable being a girl. You're not going to try to fix that child. You're going to accept that child, which led me to start speaking across the globe. I've now spoken in 30 countries. I've lectured roughly to over 300 universities. And when I come and speak to you, if you're in a university such as this, I ask one question. How many of you in this room know a transgender person? Raise your hands. How many of you in this room personally know a transgender woman? Transgender person, anybody? Anybody, okay. Think about that as a student coming into a university. Think about that. You come in and you feel excluded. I am the only one in this university that feels like this. And this is what happens. I was recently, before the war, I was in Israel. I had 300 people in front of me and I asked, how many of you know a transgender person? Three hands went up and two of them were the professors that brought me in. Think about this, and this is where we need more inclusivity and what it takes to be you know, more accepting to be who we are. And this is where I truly, truly believe the targeted audience is. You guys are the ones that are gonna make the difference. So what, as we're walking through these presentations, listening to these presentations, I'm completely bump on low because my whole presentation was completely screwed up by my friend Kaya because she had already, because <laughs> I love her to death. We have done some work together here back in South Africa about two years ago. And, um, and she is truly, truly, truly an inspirational speaker. So I really, really thrilled that I got to see her again today. Um, and the doctor over here was just absolutely phenomenal, you know. So, uh, but one of the things that I wanted to discuss was just going back on some of the things that you had talked about, the restrooms. Where I come from in America, restrooms after, um, what's his name? Trump became press, a president, bathrooms became a huge issue, all right? It suddenly became a huge issue. There, right now, when I go to the University of Florida and lecture at the University of Florida, even though I've had my gender confirmation surgery, nobody knows that I'm transgender. I can get thrown in jail and spend a year in jail in the state of Florida. Now, that is the laws that they have passed. These are some of the things that they do. Most countries around the world do not care. You go to the country of Japan, you have halls and there's stalls and they go to the floor and there's no, it's male or female, there is none. It says toilet. And this is where we're coming down to it. Just like one, you, one of you guys were saying, why do we have to have a toilet label that says male or female? How about just toilet, these single stalls. A few years ago, I was at the University of Free State and we were doing work with the residents. We said, how can we make these toilets more acceptable with the residents? And I said, well, how about just we lose, lose the labels? You know, upstairs you had a female, down below you had the male, and in the center you had a gender neutral toilet. That's another thing that I wanted to talk about. In California, they passed a law that says every building should have a gender neutral toilet. And it says gender neutral. It's a, it's a blue triangle and it says gender neutral all right but what happens if you go into a lumber yard if you go into a grocery store and somebody like me well I'm going to use the gender neutral toilet it's a target that means that that person is transgender and people don't feel comfortable in the trans community going into some of these toilets because it makes us a target why does it have to say gender neutral how about just a big toilet sign on there. And I found this at the University of Free State. They said that we have a gender neutral toilet and I was talking to a young trans man. He goes, I won't use it because the students there will know that I'm transgender. I don't feel comfortable doing it. So this is just one aspect and you guys were talking about that, but I find that just one of the greatest ways just down with the toilet. Make the doors go to the floor, and sometimes you can't do it all, but sometimes it's just a little simple piece of paper that says toilet that says that. So excuse me while I go through my notes because I changed my whole presentation around because you guys, but there was a few aspects that I wanted to talk about, um, but uh, the toilets um, in across 
England where I live, um, self-identification when you go up to a university is a completely open and accepting. You go to your professor, my gender ID says male, but you go to the professor, say, I identify as female, and they by law have to do it. England is falling backwards right now. They are literally falling backwards. They're following America's plan. Just not long ago, Ron DeSantis of Florida came into parliament in the UK and started influence them on toilet issues. Now the United States government, I mean the British government will not, when they build a new building, they will do not do gender neutral toilets. That's how far America is influencing England, where I live. England, one of the reasons I moved there, because it was open and accepting, and it seems to be going backwards. Again, a lot to do with America's influence. I do a lot of stuff across Europe, um, and, in the, and again, people are more open and accepting in different parts of the world. You know, I'm kind of going on a rant, so <laughs> I'm not going to talk too much because I want more of a discussion here today, and that's what I want to do. Like I said, my complete presentation was screwed up because of my sister over there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not just kidding. I love you. Um, it's just because of the my whole talking points were completely switched around, but I want to keep this more of a discussion, and that's why we said let's do a panel together, so I'm going to pass it over. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Juliana Davids, uh, pronouns she, her. I am the Inclusive and Affirming Education Coordinator at Triangle Project. Um, Triangle Project is um, one of the oldest LGBTIQA plus human rights organization on the continent. Uh, this is our 43rd year of existence. We should not be existing anymore, right? Um, so that was not a, a proud moment. It was just really, it's, it's, it's frustrating to be able to, you know, to have to be doing this, um, for, you know, still in 2024. Um, listening to Debbie and Jess, I am very grateful that I'm based in South Africa. Um, I've, we've been peeping and, and, and looking at the U.S. and what's happening there. It's, it seems like a nightmare, and um, my heart go out, heart goes out to all of you on that side of the world. Um, 
I think for me today, um, the importance of creating inclusive and affirming schools and higher education uh, for Triangle Project, um, it contributes to the development of inclusive societies, right, and sustainable communities. But for us, this starts at the school level, right? So I would like to share with you um, some of the work that we're doing in schools um, through a video, just a short video that I would like to share with you. Welcome to the journey. Um, and then we'll take it from there. Welcome to the journey of Triangle Projects, creating inclusive and affirming schools program. From learner leadership to advocacy and media engagement, we've been working tirelessly to create safe, inclusive and affirming schools for all. Our program empowers learners to lead initiatives, from impactful conversations to advocacy campaigns that address things like gender-based violence, through media engagement, including photography workshops, we amplify their voices and promote artivism activities, such as movement therapy. We're not alone in this journey. We collaborate with educators and teacher unions like Satu and other stakeholders to train educators on SOGSC, and we do this with workshops. Together, we're creating safe spaces and fostering inclusivity in schools. But our reach goes beyond the classroom. We work with social workers, psychologists, and traditional healers to support holistic well-being. At the policy level, learners advocate for change, amplifying their voices in national consultations on SOGSC guidelines and school-inclusive policies. Learner pride events celebrate diversity and promote well-being. With participation from schools like the Dominican School for the Deaf and Vista Nova, we cater to and reach learners with disabilities. We're proud to include rural areas in our focus as well, ensuring inclusivity across all communities. We extend our reach to higher education institutions like CPUT and UWC, fostering a supportive environment for LGBTQI plus learners. Together, we're creating a future where every learner feels safe, seen and valued beyond high school. Join us as we continue to champion inclusivity, advocacy and empowerment in our schools and communities. Together we can create a brighter, more inclusive future for all. So together, let's build inclusive communities, one school at a time. Well, our triangle projects. All righty. Um, okay, so, yeah, that's basically uh, what we're doing, um, but it's a bit difficult to explain this in a PowerPoint presentation, so um, I'm just going to walk you through the different aspects of it. Um, I want to share a quote with you that's been uh, making the rounds, um, actually, the last few days. I don't know if you are aware of the backlash that the, the, the Department of Education has experienced the last couple of months, actually, with the, with the work around SOGES, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, and sex characteristics within schools. And uh, I, I don't know if it's a parent or who said this, but um, they say that when, a, an LGBT, when LGBT IQA plus learners are empowered and supported at the school level, they bring a wealth of perspectives and experiences. No, this is not the quote. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is the one. So if children with diverse sexual orientations, gender identities and expressions and sex characteristics are old enough to experience homophobia, transphobia and intersex phobia at school, cisgender children are old enough to be taught about expansive gender identities and diverse sexualities. So there has been a huge backlash um, against the, you know, the work that we do in schools and the work that we do in higher education as well, for, specifically from very conservative religious um, parents and institutions. Um, the trend is repeating itself here in South Africa as well. And we have 
Unfortunately, that's, that's, or fortunately for us, that's been a lot of noise. And um, organizations like Triangle and Gender Dynamics, Irante, has been, they've been doing work silently, um, you know, because that is just a lot of noise that's happening. And we found that, that schools and higher institutions are very open to this work. We found that, um, especially within the rural areas, um, the rural schools and the colleges there are very open. They have been um, welping, welcoming this work. Um, a lot of the schools there, uh, for example, in the Southern Cape, in um, uh, the Karoo area, they have been um, actually changing some of their bathrooms um, without any noise and any sort of, uh, they, they, they didn't make it a big deal to just change the bathrooms to toilets, right? Um, changing the, the, the disability toilets to just toilets. The, the, some of the schools made the staff toilets available to learners with, with diverse gender identities. So um, this, this work doesn't have to be formal and you know, go through a whole process. There's a, there's a lot of passion. Um, within the schools, within the, the institutions, um, we're actually doing this work, you know, um, si very silently. Um, and that is not something that we speak about often. Um, let me go back to my, my presentation here. I actually have one. Um, so Triangle Project, um, through our, our intersectional feminist approach, um, we are really trying to create a society, especially within the education domain, that values diversity, equity, and inclusion. Of course, where all individuals have access to education and live their lives to the to their fullest potential. Um, of course, we do this uh, to to ensure access to education, support mental health and well-being, foster um, academic success, and prepare students uh, for a diverse society. Uh, and of course, promote uh, justice and human rights. Um, within the, the, the project um, and the development of the, the SOJ's guidelines developed by uh, DBE, we work together with the Children's Commission and Equal Education Law Center, for example, um, had um, some, some consult, learner consultations on these guidelines for a learner voice to be present within these guidelines. And this is a, the very similar processes that we are duplicating within the higher education spaces as well. Um, so we believe that uh, to redress some of the, the societal inequities, uh, this, should, this should be, this belief should be grounded that uh, within the belief that, that LGBT youth leadership, advocacy, and, advo and activism can drive systemic change. And of course, this whole process needs to be student and learner led. Um, and that's what we believe in, um, that learners and students should take the lead on any type of advocacy and activism um, that, uh, that drives this process for them. Um, at Triangle Project, we also encourage and, and provide um, institutional capacity building um, through training for, for educators, uh, SMTs, SGBs, parents, and at the higher education level, student um, teachers as well. Um, and of course, we try to build safe and, and, and secure spaces for our learners, um, including um, inclusive facilities within the, these institutions as well. Um, and of course, we've, I've, I've shared how we do this. Um, and this is just basically a list of some of the, the, the areas where we work, uh, some of the schools and the, the higher institution, higher education institutions as well. Um, and some of the areas that we are focusing on uh, is specifically around uh, sensitivity and confidentiality, um, accessible housing um, within higher education, um, with, within schools, we, cons we uh, you know, work around the careful consideration of um, LGBT and gender non-conforming uh, student outings and excursions. Um, and of course, one of the biggest uh, 
issues that we're dealing with is the gender inclusive or diverse bathroom facilities. And um, yeah, other issues that, we, that we're focusing on is issues around consent, curriculum, uh, preferred names, pronouns, uh, gender neutral language within the class, etc. Yeah. Um, can I ask you to come and assist me again, please? With just a... Oh, I think I have it. That's okay. Just a last short video about uh, learner advocacy that I would like to share with you. And then I'll be done. For me, when I hear the word democracy, I'm first word that comes into my mind is that freedom. For me, it's state. For me, it's change. It can be created from the ground and it's direct liberation. It comes with um, heal. Mm -hmm. um, equal. Um, it also comes with change to me. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it's respect. Are you a course creator, coach, or consultant? Do not make a course or ebook. <laughs> For me at school, my um, my rights are violated a lot, and I'm not freely the way I am at like in my community because we have different people, and we have transphobic people around at school that we, we learn with, even our teachers. And it's so painful for us that we people that call ourselves transgenders, because this time where we um, have to enter, we have to go to the toilets. Then now the, the, the trick comes, um, where are you gonna go? Are you gonna go to the girl's side? Are you gonna go to the boy's side? And then when you go to the girl's side, the girls are gonna question you, why are you here? because you're a boy and then when you go to the gay side the, I mean the, the, the boy side the boys are making jokes why are you here aren't you supposed to be in the girl side like it's, it's I'm not freely as myself at school we need a platform whereby about Amalungelo A2, first of all. Ngoba, Sinashala Apple Seki, Sibis Nawaz Amalungelo A2. First of all, Sinawaz Amalungelo, the basic rights that we have. But Amalungelo A2 as the LGBTQI community. Ukuti Alapi Apelipi. And then how can we respond to umuntu evaluate amalungelo ethu yeah. and then we need a platform where we can teach abantu ba street how to respect us how to address us how to I, attend our situation i think um let it start there in the uh, life orientation class i think that's the base it could, could start there you yes. see the basic and then probably it will grow further um, the life orientation teachers need to be specific. My principal says, Baba, I don't like the fact that you are lesbian. Mm. Then I was like, hey, hey, but I'm mm. she a ganjan. And the man's band I'm going to sell ganjan. But don't end the two lesbian. Don't that. Don't tell us that we're tired. And I need another daughter. You see? 
yes. and then go, go straight umdumdala like it's for me to know it's for him to find out mm-hmm. you see so yeah, I don't like the fact that you are a lesbian and then go go go, you need to change. That first of all, Mama Manda said, mm-hmm. there's no need to buy my baby. No, I won't do that. Mama Manda said, but I can't go go go. I can't go 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 I'm going to stop it here. I just wanted to illustrate the importance of having learner voices, um, you know, speak about their own experiences. And I wanted to bring their voices into this room as well. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, I will say Molweni so that Debbie learns a new word, another new word. Okay, uh, my name is Sineli. Am I audible? My name is Sineli Zunochigila, CRC, CSRC president. Uh, I am just here again to address a matter that is still very taboo, I would say. I believe it, the purpose of this event really stems from the realization that we really need to have a, a thing to create culti- or cultivate spaces for the queer community within our institution. I just want us to actually be more on the, f- on the fact that says, I actually like to use my hands a lot, maybe I should use the... Okay, sorry about that. Um, As I was still saying, can we really look at today's event from the point of saying, maybe we may not really or directly experience the injustice and discriminations faced by the, the trans and diverse students, but can we make sure that they are represented, valued and secured um, a lot has been said, especially by U, Dr. Butelis, and he did say, let's do away with the reputation. So in the interest of time, I will just um, emphasize on a few. And I'm actually glad that my presentation is after the Q&A because I believe that your questions did highlight some of the challenges that we actually face as the students. Um, Firstly, I believe it stems from a lack of personal understanding. That's where our differences start. Um, There's a lot of lack of inclusive policies. Yes, there are policies, but do we really comply? Are we all responsible? Are we really accountable? Then something that was all that has been mentioned throughout this event today was administration discrimination. For instance, at CPUT, there's still the question of non-binary. It's either I'm addressed as a he or a she. It is also important that I highlight the limited access to gender affirmative facilities such as restroom and changing rooms, which gives us the impression that there is a lack of understanding Another issue that has been quite mentioned as we have been engaging with students regarding this issue was residence placement. We are placed really based on assumption. Maybe we are really having an issue of cultural blockage, I don't know. Um, You know, from from the conversations I've been having with the transgender students, one of them actually gave me a response to say, I will read as he actually said it. There has been no room for queer and trans diversity from the point of stepping into the institution. During orientation, 
if ever the LGBTQIA approbation is mentioned in this institution, it is covered with inclusivity, which really never happens. We are told queer, trans, and divert, uh, as we are told as queer, trans, and divert students that we belong. We are told that we are valid, but it is still hard to create a space, even on tournaments, that we play. The broader point is that we still have people with power that cover us with a smile in our presence. The community that we exist in claims to be inclusive, but yet they still think it's cute that they know our first names, but they still call us Chomi. Imagine for other students that are still come out, that are still scared to come out and be themselves because of the environment that we exist. After um, receiving this um, response, it really took me back to a, re a recent study that I was perusing by Dr. Dalki Ramuko, Ramukowe. She was shedding light on some of the daunting, ch daunting challenges that confront the queer community, especially in terms of their, me their mental health. The numbers that she presented of individuals within this community is, 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 is quite alarming due to accessible support system. And with my encounters with many transgender students, it raises to me the question, can we claim to be generally an inclusive community if we remain quiet in the, faces of, in the face of such indifferences? Is it not time that we endeavor to fashion spaces where members of the queer community feel empowered to express their true selves, where they are shielded from prejudice and, just, and discrimination? Can we not just create spaces that we perceive merely as heavens of refuge for them, maybe, but spaces that are component of communal fabric where diversity is, does not only acknowledge them but celebrate them as well? But I must say, in the presence of the Center of um, Gender and Di Inclusivity and Social Change, we do really appreciate the effort and the strides that you have been doing. But from the perspective of research and experiences shared, it is like quite evident that we still need to embark on a journey of education. I will really emphasize on that. But not for, only, not for us, but for others as well. Can we challenge this taboo conversation? Okay. Um, it is my understanding that there are initiatives such as the CPUT Queer Unicorn. There are talks that are, are organized by student services that seek to present inv invaluable opportunities to enlighten enrichment. There are programs like Studying Sexuality, which pro uh, focuses on the experience of sexual orientation and gender identity in African higher learning institutions. Can we embrace and expand on those? Quite a couple of times, mental health has been mentioned here. I am sure Usman Kele, after me, is going to stand up and speak on the effect it has on their mental health. And I am sure he is going to urge all of us to ensure access to mental health resources that tailor to the unique need of the queer community. But how do we do that? Can we prioritize the establishment of queer affirming support system within our communities? Can we also foster a culture of acceptance and understanding? Um, because I've been given 15 minutes, but then I'll cut it short. Um, lastly, can we force dialogues that actively, not just dialogues, but dialogues and conversation that actively engage and amplify the voices of the queer individuals? Can this conversation address systematic inequalities? Can we let their narratives and perspectives serve as the cornerstone and endeavors that will assist us to effect this change? And lastly, I will say something that makes us all uncomfortable. Can we be honest? Can we not, be cla can we not claim to be allies if we really fail to actively champion and elevate those whose rights and dignities are all too often marginalized or overlooked? My emphasis as the student voice from CPUT is that 
can we actively engage the queer individuals because their narratives and perspectives will continue to serve as our cornerstone. I have learned something funny from all of us. We love the queer culture until it's time to confront the lived realities and experiences of the queer community. Can we abstain from our lack of concern and embrace accountability and be the proactive allies we claim to be? Can this be the beginning of a journey where we really look at the creation of safe spaces for the queer community within our CPUT community? I am certain that um, there are other queer com um, okay, Ooh, technology. I am certain that there are queer communities that would very much appreciate it that each and every one of us could unite to advocate what is just and to ensure that every individual, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, feels not only safe but cherished and respected. One, two. Thank you very much. Um, let me greet you again. My name is Simamkele Mapikana. I am the current acting spokesperson and secretary for CPU to create cons, which was launched about two years ago. Um, before I speak, I would like to um, just make mention of the people that paved the way for us the likes of Cabello Rapolo, the likes of Ludo Ndeleni, the likes of um, Ananim Talaliso, Tabelo, um, Madeu, and, and a lot of others that are not here present today. It is through their work that we are able today to sit here and have these conversations with you about our experiences. So when I received this email that uh, the Center for Diversity and Inclusivity for Social Change is hosting this uh, event, uh, and they want a member from the CPU to Cons to share their experience. Who? Who? Because um, from a perspective of someone who, who went through a lot uh, for being themselves, for being the person that they want to be without being, for without explaining how they feel or how they want to exercise their rights of being a person in a basic education system to the higher education system, system and never be literally given a platform to be yourself, but rather being shoved at the back and try and be try to be your light and try your and they deem your light or uh, uh, yeah i think you get what i'm trying to say i'm so nervous because i'm <laughs> so um i wanted firstly to say it is very paramount for us to 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 understand that when you are attacking queer, trans, and diverse student, you are actually hurting someone who, who is not comfortable yet to be themselves. Because, for example, I may be comfortable, I may walk freely on campus, I do not care what you say to me, but when you say, you say it to someone else who is not yet confident to be with themselves, you are killing themselves, you are killing that person to express themselves positively, you are killing them to be who they are, you are giving them an identity that they do not want to be seen as. So, um, that is what is that what uh, came into my mind. So let's go to my experience growing up or being around the, the, the education system in South Africa. I grew up in the Eastern Cape, um, Queenstown. Um, mostly of you may know it, some of you may, may not. In between Queenstown and Lady Frame, uh, one of the deep administrative area called Matribini. Uh, and uh, I grew up in a huge family. 
one of uh, we in a family of grandchildren great grandchildren and great great grandchildren so i am the third generation akaya and then I, I was fortunate enough to 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 be raised by my great grandmother so when you grow up in that system of uncles and aunts you are expected to uphold a certain standard for example if you are a boy you are expected to wake up early in the morning you go to the kraal you take out cows you go them you, you let them graze you come back at four but for me it was kind of a different situation because i was my grandmother's closest to the heart because when the, my uncles wake up, they would um, forcefully want me to also wake up with them. And my grandmother would be like, no, not my grandchild. She is, he is not going there. I think at the point she realized that Simam Kele is very different from the rest. I think she realized that there are things that Simam Kele finds happiness when she's doing, like making her coffee, like wanting to assist in the kitchen, like wanting to be just hands-on when it comes to house chores rather than being with the men outside. Of which, as I was growing up, I was not scared to do them. I wanted to approach them. I wanted to see how do, how do these things work out because it started the word of Imofi, Stabani. I heard them first, Ekaya, because from home when you are not compiling to men cuties you'll be a stubborn man to stop doing this and growing in a closer family whereby there's a man that wants to uphold those standards around the community that will judge the family and you understand what i'm trying to say so i grew up in that type of system but my grandmother was very protective of me of me shame than band so um I then, after uh, passing of my, of my mother in 2005, I then, I was four years then, and then at five, I, I had to go to school. When I stepped into school, the school system uh, had a boy and a child, I mean, had a boy and a girl uh, space, and then I, I, I don't think I minded, I minded at the time because I didn't know, but I knew that I was very different from the rest of the classroom. I was very different in my community. I would sing in the most, in the, in the most beautiful way, I like a girl. I had a beautiful soprano then, because if you buy ten, you can lady, and then I was. In high school, I joined the, 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 the junior choir, and then I was in the front with the ladies, with girls, child. I was the only boy in the middle, and then I was not singing the altos and whatever. And then I grew up in the system, and then when I started to do grade two, lucky enough, I was very smart, I was very open, I wanted to learn more, I wanted to get more of what the system is to offer to me and also coming from a home whereby there's no one who who did who passed grade 12 there's no one who went to varsity so now i am given an opportunity such as that so uh, and then i went to to grade two grade two that's where all started when obviously in grade two you are now paired you are into paired into groups there's a group you need to pay yourself for a project or a an an, an a work that you are going to do that's why I started to see that, no, man, I do not belong in the boys' side. Also, on the girl side, too, I am not super comfortable. And then I would sit, I would make an excuse that, ma'am, can I please use the bathroom? Can I go to the bathroom quickly? And I would sit in the benches of Claim Boy back then, and I would sit there, and then I let, I let them choose their group quickly when I come back. As as we are short here, please come join us. So that's how I avoided the, 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 go, the choosing of groups. And then I started to grow. I see that, no, man, this thing of me is going on, is going on, is going on in terms of making friendships. But luckily, I was in the top two and definitely not two. So students would definitely come to me uh, to be like, Sima, can I partner with you? So it was never now, now that I have a choice to partner with. I, I, it's not like I'm going to choose at first to partner with you, but because I know that you are good in mathematics, I know that you are good in, in English, I'm going to partner with you because of your capabilities, not because who you are. Because outside the classroom, when you are going to play, you are not my friend. I don't know you. 
then now it started to grow it started to to also be a question in in, in even in the sports in the sports um in the sports activities that i carried in school and i, I grew up tall and big i had a body i was tall so uh, my teachers would also be like, you are going to play rugby because you are tall, you are going to be a scrum half. I'm like, nope, I'm not doing that. And I am not going to play rugby. I am soft, I can't do that. And doctors told me that I cannot play rugby and soccer. So that was the end of the conversation. And, the, and until they be like, give us a medical certificate to prove that you, are ca you can't play these things. So um, I think I, I passed my, 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 my I, I, I did well in primary school without any questions of anything. I went to high school. That's where I started to be myself. I, in, in, a, in an environment that didn't allow to be my, to be, to, for me to be myself, that's where I forced to be myself. That's where I started to be like, I am not going to be, to be, to be to be placed in a in a room that I am not comfortable in, I found that my feet in in because my room in my in high school in high school, I, I'm not mentioning people that were not comfortable, but I was one of the people that were brave to say, say I am not a boy, I am not a girl, I am Simam Kele. Please address me as so. So I think that's when it started to, to build up now, okay, I, f I feel like in a world out there, maybe in Cape Town, I always dream to go to Cape Town because from grade R up, I never visited anyone outside the province. I was always stagnant to stay there. So now I'm like, Cape Town, definitely there has to be a room for queer people, for people like me or rather. Then, um, and then I started to, 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 to work for, I started, no, no, not working. I started to, to be a voice and I always wanted to hold a position. I became the president of the metric council of learners. That's when I was like, the principal, luckily then she was a lady. I was like, principal, there are students that are coming in yearly who are queer. Some of them, are I, I, I was understanding now the terminology of LGBTQI. I was understanding the definition and I was learning about the people of the flag and everything. Then now you are in a varsity. Obviously, when you are about to go to varsity, you have expectations. You have expectations of now go to a varsity. These people are old. These people are, are very matured. These people are, are doing things in this order and this order. This is how they are principled. They are quite um, educated people and they are aware of it all. I came into, into CPUT during the time of covid uh, and then I was in the online system. Online system, uh, you you don't know who's who and what is what. But luckily, I say our pay like it was almost ending. Uh, and then when it ended, uh, COVID nineteen, we get to meet the real faces, the real people in real time. That's where I knew that CPUT CPUT is not as inclusive as it says it can, it, it is. It is not as catering to queer, trans, and diverse students as it says it is. And then CPUT Queer Cons was launched, and we had our hopes to the to the sky and back. We were like, "Yo, finally, we are going to be able to participate in school tournaments. Finally, we are going to be able to to walk with our mini skirt without being looked at." Finally, we are going to be able to wear our makeup and weaves without being told that you are not supposed to do that. But sadly, that still happens because a man needs to hold a principle. A woman needs to be in the kitchen. Those are the principles that a lot of students are still holding. Sometimes people can say it's cultural block, which is something I learned today, cultural block. I was like, ah. Is that how we call it? Because I believed that when you are in, a, in this institution or when you are in a higher learning institution, you broaden your knowledge or you want to learn more about different people, then you are able to say, you decide for yourself, but do I take this or do I not take this? Same as peer pressure. If you're going to say, uh, my friends, uh, 
are driving me to drink alcohol, then you made a choice to drink alcohol too much. So information that is given to you and not taking it, that's called ignorance to me. That is total ignorance. So um, it, was, it is not quite a, 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 a nice journey to walk if you are from the rural areas and not sensitized enough about yourself and you are, or you are still trying to figure out who you are but when you find yourself and you find your feet, you are like, no, 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 no. I'm not doing this with you. I am who I am. And then just because you think that I am gay, it doesn't mean that I'm, I cannot compile to my cultural um, upholdings. For example, I'm a closer when I'm in Eastern Cape. I know that if my home needs to be represented in, in the village, I have to go there as a man and represent Kayalam. Being queer, being queer doesn't prevent me from doing anything, but rather it is my identity, it is who I am, and it is who I didn't choose to be, but it is what I grew up feeling. So I, I feel like when we, out of this, 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 this uh, conversation that are going to happen today, I feel like it is high time that we stop um, saying that queer people are, are demonic or whatever, but rather start to say to, to, to teach ourselves that these people are people like me and you. Their sexual conduct, how they deal with their situation behind or in the bedroom, is none of your concern. Same as they do not involve themselves in your bedroom stuff because now you are trying to invade themselves, you are trying to sexualize people, you are trying to start now, what Dominic says, they fet they, 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 they men start to fetish him because they see some they see that uh, they can try out things with him. So yeah, I think I can stop there. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been a very interesting conversation and I'm hoping you were listening with the ear that says, so how do we take the combination of this information and make it practical and make it livable within CPUT? Because that is what is important. We've heard uh, from an international perspective, we've heard even from a parent who is raising a child, how that um, the discrimination that they encounter in the community at school cycle back to back home and how does a parent then stand up and start supporting. But we've also from Jessica had her lived experiences and how those have actually shaped who she is today and how she has become. Um, I, I liked how the Triangle Project kind of gave us voices as well. Because when you had the, the naming and the labeling, and my biggest thing is, do we sitting in this room have alternative words to use? Is, is it necessary that we have a word to use? Because when I, as a heterosexual individual, no one goes around calling you hetero. Is there anyone who calls you that? No one is actually interested who you kiss and who you sleep with. But why if it's uh, someone who's gay and lesbian or transgender, we all want to know, what is the fascination? Uh, why, why? Like, think about it. Why are we so fascinated about what happens in other people's lives to a point that we start giving it names, we start creating narratives that make people uncomfortable, continue to make people to be excluded instead of being included. So just around there as well, just um, re 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 uh, cycle back and reflect. And then from the president of the student um, council, I think you gave us a challenge um, because it's, it's like, so we've had everything, but so what now? Um, so in that challenge, I think it will be more uh, going forward if we also take up that challenge and make a better CPUT. And then in, cl in closing, 
Usima, I like how you took us from your birth. Uh, there's an exercise I like doing called my birth story. Because all of us sitting here, we have a birth story of some sort. Sometimes it finds itself in the name that you get given. Sometimes it finds itself in where you are raised. So you'll be raised by Ukoko Gakoko because you can't be raised by Ukoko here because Ukoko here has their religion, culture, and whatever. So there is a story of birth that is closely knit to our gender identity and our sexual orientation. And all of us here have a story around that, irrespective whether we are heterosexual or you are the people flag, you, you have a story of death. And thank you for being honest and taking us through and how your liberation, when you thought your liberation has come, you also started to be uh, faced with new nuances of exclusion and discrimination. So I'm going to ask you to um, now take the opportunity to place your questions. It's going to be an open Q&A a session, uh, but with the vision of the future people. Ne? Let's try and help the center so that the center is able to advise the university in a way that becomes progressive, in a way that makes CPUT a place to be at and a place where all of us are included and feel that we belong. So uh, questions? Oh, I'll start there. One, two, three, four. Those are the first questions. One, two, three, four. Um, yeah, can you help me? With, and if people can also say who they are so that it's easy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andisi Lesedui. I'm from Fundani. Okay. That's my boss there in the corner. Oh, hi, boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, um, I didn't know about the center. Oh. No, I didn't know that there's something like this at, at, at CPUT. But thanks to my friend here who invited me, Johannes. Mm. Um, I was listening to the first two speakers, uh, actually all the speakers, but I was taking notes as people were talking. And um, the obsession on people's sexuality is something that I don't understand. Mm. I mean, we have so many problems in the world. Uh, Iran is bombing Israel. Um, South African youth are unemployed, but we have this obsession um, about who sleeps with who, or yeah, something like that. And I mean, um, my colleagues from America, uh, I am shocked, but not shocked, um, that America is doing what Uganda is doing. You know, your country claims to be the advocates of human rights, but they are not, and we, we all know that. Coming to South Africa, we know we have this wonderful constitution in inverted commas. Um, I'm currently reading for a PhD in educational psychology. Mm -hmm. And I'm f looking at lecturers, how lecturers create inclusive spaces to prepare pre-service teachers for inclusive classrooms. That's what I'm currently mm -hmm. doing. And to the center and to my director, I know I've collected data. We have a lot. Mm. I've had uh, shocking stories, and CPUT is one of the universities where I'm, I'm conducting the study. Mm. Uh, it, in one faculty, I had a story where there's, um, there was a transgender student that had to drop out because she, I'm uh, sorry guys, forgive me, I'll get wrong the, the pronouns. Um, she was forced to wear a suit, like the suit that men wear, to go when they go for teaching practice. Mm. And the student dropped out, and when he reapplied, one colleague said, we shouldn't uh, readmit your student because he doesn't know where he belongs, sure. whether he's a female or a male. I mean, that's a, a, someone with a PhD that's supposed to know better, mm. you know. So I just wanted to make that comment uh, to say as the institution, we have a lot to do. The center is not holding in the, in the faculties. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's as a contribution, and I guess you will also reflect on it as the panel. Uh, two there, and three, and then four at the end. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Abu Zachonas. Uh, mm-hmm. Firstly, I want to say that uh, I'm quite impressed by uh, how the panel is structured because it has taken us from an internationalist view of the gender question into a, a local view where mm-hmm. uh, uh, in every successful revolution, if I can label this that, they have taken whatever or um, 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 how things happen in other places, other views, other perspectives and everything. And for it to be successful is to take it and put it in the context of the reality of that place is going to apply it in. So by Usima explaining his lived experience in the context of South African rural areas, particularly in the Eastern Cape, has taken the internationalist view of the gender question, which uh, 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 Ms. Jessica Lynn addressed in accordance with their lived experience in America mm-hmm. and brought it to a South African level where we can understand it, all of us. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to be wrong about this or what. Mm-hmm. I want to be a bit technical because I've been watching a, a, a you know, most of free Wi-Fi, so we browse, we don't sleep at night. Mm-hmm. When we can't study, we browse through. So we listen to all these arguments around the, the gender question. Mm-hmm. And like I said, for us people who grew up in the rural Eastern Cape, we are only exposed to the internet 24 hours here in Varsity. So we're coming into contact with this new concept. So I, I'm still trying to understand. In South Africa, for you to drive a car, you have to be 18 years old. For you to vote, you have to be 18 years old. If you come to Varsity here, and maybe you are 16 years old or eight, less than 18, your parent has to sign everything for you. You can't open a bank account. You can't do all these things. Now, coming to the question of gender transition, I can agree personally that, I don't know the experience, but I can say that in accordance with the rules and laws of South Africa, I don't know how they were determined. Maybe they said um, you are mentally fit enough when you are 18 to make this decision, that is to drink alcohol, drive a car and do whatever, take responsibility. How then do we determine that or how how, how do we take it into concept that a four-year-old child can decide on their own that I want to transition? Is it something that perhaps as a society we can open for discussion that a four-year-old child must be given that option of deciding and yet the very four year old or let's say eight year old is not allowed to 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 live on their own but is given this huge decision that will impact them their entire life to make that decision so i I don't know if i'm going to say it's an engagement or what but i just have a question around that I, i have a bit of difficulty understanding it like Kusima explained it, when growing up as Lalin, uh, uh, we have three phases where I come from. Uh, uh, whereby, uh, uh, when you are young, you become a man, 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 then you become a then you die after that. Mm. So, that, that's the structure of our society. Yes. Now, when you are within a certain group, within that structure of our society, you are not allowed to make certain decisions. Mm. You, are, you, are, you are just not allowed. And it's mainly based on the age, uh, uh, on your age. So I, I just want to, to, I have questions around that. Okay. Uh, uh, lastly, I want to say to, to the mother of the child who experienced, uh, just I think you are, you are a very strong person. I don't think it's easy for anyone or everyone to have their child discriminated in any way whatsoever. Uh, be, be, be it gender issues, disability or whatnot. And I just want to say that I, I, I admire you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The third question. 
Thank you uh, once again. My name is Tani Gitlinklovu, and mm. my prefer I have no preferred pronouns, by the way. Um, I have a whole theory on that as well, on why we should <laughs> enforce people to have preferred pronouns as well. Um, I've been heavily captured by the previous speaker, but um, just a quick um, sort of, of what's been happening. Firstly, um, the importance of the effect and support of children. I think we're heavily captured and into showing how the support of parents can be something that plays a big role into moving and having such discourse and policy changes within um, certain um, spaces of society and why we need it as institutions as well. So from the institution side, I don't think we should only looking at, we should look at it coming out from, let's say, our parents, but our voices within the institution and mm. stuff members as well, pushing for that same energy that speaker had when he came to their children is something that we should be driving for. But mm. the second thing also, looking at the next speaker, when we're speaking about the um, transgenders, most people that are, are transitioning or people that are transgender um, tend to be scared to like be, um, travel around a lot because of the bias societies and all. Mm. And from your story, having to hear that you've been to other states, I would like to also to hear your comment on what advice advice do you have for transgender people when they travel into other spaces? But also you being in Africa and South Africa, we still have, even though we have the most beautiful constitution, we still have most places that are the most homophobic and dangerous places. So that encouragement and motivation to young people into saying this is how you've kept safe and when do you know not to respond as mm. you know, conflict mm. management mm. skill mm. is something important. Something then for the president of CPU here as well. As a president, I just have a question of what will you do that is different from the other presidents that you will leave in as your role as a president? Do you look in, do you, are you looking into partnerships with um, Center for Diversity and Inclusivity for Change uh, within your SRC role and term? And also, your plans of engaging and partnering up with structures such as queer unicorns? And does maybe, let's say, does your POA for the year have any program that looks at into supporting, mm -hmm. knowing that we have these students. And from what you have said as well, you have had some that approach you. As we go into also Pride Month, as the president, will we see the Pride flag and our campus being a rainbow nation? That would be something that is a highlight of your term, because it, have never, it has never been done before. Um, mm -hmm. Something we like from the um, last speaker is also that when they speak um, and speak about why we should, our sexuality should never separate us from culture is something very important that was that we learn a lot, a lot from the speaker mm -hmm. because when they highlight the importance of culture and why one sexuality should never separate them from their culture is where we see that identity is something important because even though someone sleeps with someone of the same gender of the same sexuality whatsoever it should not make that person any less within their culture or any less within their society mm -hmm. and going back into communities like that, if we are able to start having such discourse and communication towards and teaching people such, showing that just because someone identifies as a gay man, it does not change him being a Kosa man in any mm. way and stop them from doing anything. This just shows that people's choices and culture shouldn't be separated in any form. If I keep on speaking, I'll speak for too long, but also, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at why I think mostly we need to also discourse around the things again uh, around what is gender identity versus uh, sexual identity mm. because many people really don't know about it and it's something that needs to be discussed more and may allow us for uh, students as well and to having such discourse and engagement allowing for people to do that change um, as a whole um, with that said um, thank you from my thank side. you thank you thank you I think the next time she must be on the panel, ne? There's, there's a lot there. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I feel small now that she's spoken, yo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Lunga Mesho. I'm a peer educator from the HIV and AIDS unit at District 6. Uh, I don't have a question, really. Uh, I just have comments for the panel. Uh, from the international viewpoint, um, the laws in Alabama actually, it's not my first time seeing them. There was one, there is one show, is the Top Gear, 
most of you who like cars there's a show top gear so the what the producers did to them richard um richard hammond and also you know, there are four guys there were four middle-aged guys so what they did there they gave them a um a like it's more like they are joking but not like joking because it's actually what alabama is all about so what they did is they might they should paint their cars whatever they may they they want to make sure that they piss off the people in alabama mm? so they piss off like they mm. they 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 they, 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 stick, they don't like the what what like the speaker said they don't like the people who are transgender or people who are homosexual they are homophobic basically mm. so what they wrote on their cars where we actually like for instance i like gay men uh, homophobia, homo, homo, homosexuality should be legalized. So when they actually crossed to Alabama, they were stoned. Actually, they were stoned to to a, to a point that they were they were afraid of their lives because they could get, they could even get shot mm. because of the people that actually hate a homo, a homosexuality. Um, on the view on the last speaker. I know you struggle, Dagwood. Mm. I know you struggle. <laughs> um, for instance, I've worked with people who are homosexual. I'm a heterosexual man, but I've worked with homosexual p people. Uh, I, we don't call them gay. We were instructed that we don't call a person gay, lesbian, because that's actually you are exposing their sexuality mm. or sexual orientation. Mm. You don't know if that person is gay or not. They just identify themselves as homosexual. So I've worked with people who are homosexual from high school up until now. What I will tell you is that they are vibrant, they are fun to work with, mm. and they are very funny. Mm. There's never a dull moment when you're working with those people. <laughs> for, for instance, we, we, I, I was part of a drama group in high school. So there was this person who was, who Aya, who was his name. Aya was very, like... He was not, he was out, basically. Mm. He was not in the closet. He wasn't afraid of expressing who he is. Even if he would come, he would come to you and hit on you and be like, I, tell me I love you. I'm like, what do you mean you love me? I don't love you. And I'm just like, give me a hug, like joking around. He's, he's, mm. he's not afraid of being joking around. But that, that is an environment which we created in high school for homosexual people that you don't have to be afraid. We are there for you. Mm. Even if you have an organization, because I was the co-founder of that organization of the drama group, you come with your talent. We're not going to judge you just because you're homosexual. And so we're not going to work with you because you're going hit to on, hit on me. You're going to be thinking of me sexually. sexually. You're going to be like, you're going to be lustful towards me because that's what most males do. Even if an, in our in here in um, in varsity, one of my classmates would like because I I have a roommate who is homosexual. Well, how can I stay with someone like that? Because mm. I don't know if he what he thinks of me when I come into the room. Maybe he's lustful when I'm sleeping. He's looking at me with a gaze. Well, I mm. I want this person. Mm. I'm like no. I'm I was like no, my guy. Don't think like that. Because mm. if you think like that, that's like you stigmatizing that person. That yes. person knows that he must uh, he must respect you as a heterosexual mm. male. If he has feelings for you, he come to you. Mm. And if you say no, he will back off. Yes. And you don't have to go and be like report him and talk to your friends like mm. this guy wants me and all that and all that. No, don't do that because you actually you are actually demeaning him. You, you are you are you are you are you actually you not it's 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 wrong. Mm. English has been away, guys. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for uh, encouraging the conversation and stretching it. So what I'm going to ask from the panelists is to respond and cut across, because I, I don't want anyone not to say anything. So you've heard the questions and also the, the, the comments. So can you then respond to what really sits with you so that we allow to further the conversation? Um, We'll start, we can start this way or that way. The mic is coming. 
you can decide. There's two of them. You can decide, yes. Because it's important that you, you engage and, and help CPUT to become the leader that they want to be in terms of creating an inclusive and social cohesion in the, in, 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 in the, in the higher education space. Yeah. So, Sim, are you going first? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, um, I think, let me first um, just say, CP, CPUT um, Center for Diversity, Inclusivity and Social Change, I think this year uh, owes, owes it to the CPUT community, especially queer trans diverse students for them to be advocated for, especially D6, Mowbray and Wellington campuses. I feel like they have been left behind for a very long time. I think those campuses are very far from us because we are going to have the conversation, we are almost having the conversation with the Bible students, the likes of the uh, political parties, student political parties, and other organizations that we are working with from the CPUT point of view. And I feel like if we can also start like um, seeing people for who they are, not what they do behind door closed. Because I feel like that's really unnecessary uh, research for yourself that you do, because now you are going beyond and over to see someone naked, also that is harassment. So we need to understand that when we are bringing this conversation into the institution, we are not trying to to make people know who they are not, but we are trying to create a room for that boy child who is sitting in his room with a, a homophobic roommate who is very loud about hom being homophobic. I remember last year I stayed in MGR2. Very first time staying there, I, 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 I transferred later on, uh, later the year, uh, September. I, it was a huge thing that I'm in the block for the guys. There's a queer person in the block. Mm -hmm. And when I go out, I would uh, wrap my, t my towel because I'm going to the shower, wear my slip, my slip, my slippers, go to the shower. And you will see the guys, they are smiling. I feel like there's an enticement ab around me that, oh, finally, like those things, like, that's where we need to go. We need to start creating a conversation with the student. We need to, un to see where, where is the mind of the student. We need to also tackle the powerhouse, which is the mind. So also, uh, I, was, I don't have a lot of information about your question, but I want to quote what Zanele Matoli said. She said, and I quote, if I wait for someone else to validate my existence, my existence, it will mean that I am shortchanging myself. If you can also wait for people to tell us that we are valid and queer people rather, if, 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 if those people can wait for people to tell them that they are valid and they, are, they need to be free, then it means they are failing themselves. They are failing who they are. They will forever live at the, at the, behind the door and then they will never have a room in the institution. I am always... Uh, seeing queer, queer people in the institution being shy for who they are, especially when they see Abu Putbabo, Abu Velana, Abu Islalin, people that they're coming with from their villages, they are scared to be themselves. They'll be like, yo, this one is going to tell my parents that now I am queer and, pr and proud in, in the institution. I'm doing things that I'm not supposed to do. Being queer, being queer it doesn't take anything from what, how your parents grew you mm. up. And uh, your parents didn't fail. Your parents didn't do anything, or rather the parents that are here today, they didn't do anything wrong, but rather there's something that is inside that is always burning to be, to, to come out and be itself out there and be explored. It cannot be cured, it can be not prayed away, it cannot be uh, given or is a sacrificial lamb, it cannot go away even after all those costs, but rather it will stay there because it is your identity. And I feel like, Tandi, it is very much honest that we, 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 dif we differentiate between gender identity and sexual mm -hmm. identity. Very two distinctive uh, topics that, we, that can lead us maybe to the world land, of, world land of promise that we, 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 
we may find ourselves in tomorrow. Also, the obsession on, on people's sexuality, I think I'm done now. As obsession on sexual uh, on people's sexuality, I think it comes from not knowing and not wanting to know. Because when there is so much information given to people and then people choose to not know, then they will be obsessed. How does Sima go about sexual life? Yeah. Mm. And then you start now to, to think how, how gross it is, how not so clean it is, not understanding that queer people understand these things and they are very much comfortable in their spaces and they are super happy. Kakulu. Um, if I got your question correctly, Tandi, in short, you asked what would you do different as the president? Are there any plans to support the queer community, right? Um, it's so fortunate that it was after a conversation that I was having with U Butumisha just before the event. I was sharing with him that our POA seeks to address all the social ills that we have led that are faced by our students on campus. But our main focus is to start by really forcing these conversations so that we could move to education and awareness in terms of like organizing workshops to educate students. But what really are we saying we want to see happening? Um, I also mentioned the issue of um, policy advocacy. Yes, I believe that there are policies that exist, but are we, are we really compliant? Are they really, really inclusive? Um, we're also looking at um, e-collaboration with various departments not so long ago. I was having a conversation with all the, the dean of students in terms of what we could do to collaborate with um, e-office uh, of Meladi and Ubud Dumisho. But also, we really um, encourage feedback mechanism so that we could go back to the queer community and say, do you feel that we have, are trying enough in terms of e inclusivity? What more can we do? I'll stop the just for now. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, so I wanted to respond on the question of um, consent, um, age of consent. Um, with regard in South Africa, with regards to sexual reproductive health, um, the age of consent for a, uh, um, or for someone to decide on a termination of pregnancy or any sexual and reproductive health related matters is 12 years old. So, um, with, but with regards to to um, to medical transition or medical affirmation processes, I believe that is um, something that needs to be decided between the parent, the child, and the, the medical practitioners. So there is, there's, there's no blanket um, age for that, but I think it's something that, that, um, that, is, that needs to be age specific um, or, or context and situation specific. Um, the, and I, I, I believe you can, I guess, shed some light on this matter as well, uh, based on your research. But I, uh, I wanted to respond on the issue of uh, making the distinction between sexuality and, and, and gender identity as well. Um, I had a situation where the principal of a school, um, you know, chased about nine learners away from school because two learners were transgender girls and the others were, uh, were lesbian identified girls. And the, the principal told them they got, the only condition that they will be let back into the school is if they write a letter to say that the two transgender bo uh, girls had to write a letter to say that now they will be treated as such, as girls within the schools if they want to come back with a girl's uniform. Uh, so they need to look at their hair, their, you know, the, the, um, their entire uniform. And the way that they conduct themselves and the, the bathrooms that they can use, um, they can use a bathroom of their choice. 
but the seven identified lesbians were not okay with it because they did not identify as trans boys. Um, mm. They were judged based on their sexual orientation. And of course, that's where the parents came in and advocated for those, those, uh, those lesbian identified girls. And uh, uh, actually, a district-wide education was done with the schools and the schools in the vicinity, specifically focusing on making the distinctions between sexuality and, and gender identity. So yeah, it's, it's important. Parents is important, um, mm. especially need to be at the center of, mm. of these issues when it comes to advocating for the rights of, of SOJS diverse and expansion um, characteristics. Thank you. I'm going first. <laughs> okay, I think I got, there's three topics that I wanna cover. One is to do international speaking. One is to do about being a parent or when is the age of consent to transition. And one is the difference between gender identity and sexuality. We have the big LGBTQI plus banner that you will all see. You can hear me out there, right? All right. We all have the LGBTQI plus banner. There's a lot of us in the community that do not believe the T belongs with the LGB community because being transgender and my sexuality are two completely different topics. Gender identity is here. It has nothing to do with who I'm physically attracted to. Two complete different topics. Nothing, nothing, nothing to do with who I'm physically attracted to, all right? And that is one of the biggest, biggest myths. We do join the LGBT community because we are such a small minority and number is in, power is in numbers and that's why we join together a lot with the lesbian, gay, bisexual community. Queer is a fluidity between gender and sexuality and that is where, it's a contested term, queer, but that is where the term queer comes in, is between gender and sexuality, but like again, T has nothing to do with who I'm physically attracted to. And please, please remember that. Being transgender is completely different than who I'm physically uh, attracted to. Now when it comes to when a child transitions, one of the biggest myths, especially coming out of it, I'm gonna let Debbie really focus on this because this is her expertise, but one of the biggest myths coming out of the world, especially in the UK right now, just a few days ago was reported, the CAST report that came out that they said, now we don't want to let anybody under 25 years old transition. 25 years old, you can join the military at 16, you can be a parent, you can fly an airplane at 17 years old in the UK, but you don't want you to transition at 25 years old. This is the bo this is the bullshit that's coming out of these mm. politicians and it is literally that. It is bullshit. Nobody in the world, in different parts of the world, but most WPATH rules are you cannot have gender confirmation surgery until you're 18 years old. There are mm. rare instances where it's 16 and 17 years old, but the general rule is 18 years old across mm. the globe. That's WPATH rules. And research has shown if if you came to your mom at a young child and says, I want to live my life as a girl, it's not just, oh, take it to the doctor, get your penis chopped off, start on hormones, and just live your life. Mm. It's a social transition, and that is mainly what happens at a young age. Then you have their first thing, the first pubertal suppression, then you start on mm. cross-hormone therapy. It's a long process. You have to have counseling. You have psychologists doing it. And as I said, Debbie's going to get into that aspect a little bit more. But it's not just, oh, I want to go get my you know, penis chopped off or I'm going to grow a penis to become who I am. Mm. That is a complete bullshit line. And studies have shown across the world is when you let a child live their true gender at a young age, all right, this, um, depression drops up to 79%. Suicide rates drop. One, half of transgender youth under the age of 21, a, pro, a report out of the Trevor Project in the United States worldwide, half of transgender youth have physically attempted suicide by the age of 21 because of the discrimination. So right now in America and England, things are going backward. And that's where, again, I'm gonna let Debbie talk a little bit more on that. That's her expertise. But I have a really, really hard time when people say, 
kids should not transition. And research has shown is when you let a child live their true gender, depression mm. disappears. True after statement after statement. Now, when it comes to traveling around the world, I find that there's more people than bad people, more good people than bad people. Mm. This is what I have found. When I come out, if I'm on an airplane, a bus, a train, and somebody sits next to me and we talk and we say, so what do you do? And this guy's saying, I'm a cab driver. And he goes, what do you do? You know, I, and I feel comfortable. I say, I'm a transgender activist. Oh, my sister's best friend is transgender. You find more acceptance. Mm. There are times that it is very difficult. I literally walked into a university, um, Texas Christian University in Dallas, Texas, okay? I walked in, I spent two days there. I had a room about 150, 200 people in there. I won't hit you. <laughs> I had roughly 150 people in there. I'm setting up my computer, starting to do a presentation. This lady in the front row comes up to me, hands me her business card, and she says, I'm a police officer, I'm so-and-so. Um, I am carrying a loaded weapon. There has been a death threat against you here today. Okay, so that is from the United States. When I speak in Florida, they put police officers back in the auditorium, so the discrimination. But again, um, I don't feel uncomfortable anywhere. I've been to Turkey during Ramadan. I've been there most, almost every student that I've ever spoken to, not all, but most every student I've ever spoken to is open and accepting. And that's what I have found the difference. I've been scared too. Yes, I've been some scared. I've been spent three weeks in India. That was my very first really outside of the outside of Europe, my very first international trip going across India alone. I was scared to death. Most people are open and accepting. This is my fifth, sixth, seventh trip to South Africa. I love it here. I was at, and I'll shut up in a second, but I was at the <laughs> University of Fort Hare, and I walk in the auditorium. I had two huge screens in back of me. There were six, 700 students in there, and the professor said, um, my friend Penny Joffrey now, she says, we have a transgender woman from America coming to give you a lecture. Six, 700 students started laughing. I gave my presentation an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and 30 minutes. Half of them gave me a standing ovation. Literally 400 students were queued up to say thank you. I was taught that this was a choice, that this was a choice to be gay. I had no idea. So mm. this is what I believe in. Going back to one of the other things that I wanted to talk earlier, I believe in people sharing their stories. I believe it is one of the greatest ways we can mm. educate the world. When I speak at different universities and students come out to me and say, how can I help? How can I be a better ally? Or how can I be a better advocate? And I said, get together. If you've never spoken together, get together with a few friends. Go and speak in front of a sociology class. Go and speak mm. in front of a a human sexuality class, this is the way we can end discrimination together by our stories, and I won't hit you too. <laughs> so hmm. this is how we do it. So I really, really appreciate this time with you, and I'm sorry for rambling. Your turn, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. <laughs> yeah. um, first, I, I've noticed in the conversations here, there's been reference to um, is it the government, the government isn't stepping in and doing enough and making changes, but then the NGOs are coming in and, and making the changes and who should be doing more? Um, and you, uh, the first question, you said something about the obsession with the government. Um, I don't remember exactly how you phrased it. I wish the U.S. government wasn't obsessed with trans people. I wish conservative elected officials weren't obsessed with trans people. We have more mass shootings each year in the US than we have days. Like we had one um, in the my, my hometown uh, where we just left Kansas City, Missouri um, to celebrate the Super Bowl win. Um, our football team won, big game. They're gonna have a parade. Thousands and thousands of people are outside. Uh, it's the middle of February, so it was something like the 44th day of the year, and there was a mass shooting in that crowd, and it was the 49th mass shooting of the year. So 45 or 44 days, 49 mass shootings. Our elected officials can't be bothered to do anything about gun violence because it's never the right time. Thoughts and prayers, but we're going to go obsess about trans people and their genitals and what sports they're playing and that kind of thing. So I wish we had the problem of the government slowing down and not caring quite so much. Um, to the question about 
travel just really quickly. Um, the, the different states making all of these laws is starting to cause travel concerns. Um, people are afraid to go to Florida if they're mm -hmm. trans because of the bathroom um, issue, but also they have a law that they say um, if a parent is affirming their trans child and another parent isn't, like it's a custody dispute and a divorce, um, will protect your child from that uh, affirming parent. So if you're in Florida, we could potentially help you get custody of your child and take the child away from the affirming parent. So, hey, just come on down. Um, and there's also a fear of... Um, parents who are LGBT, that they could be investigated and have their children taken away from them because the governor there has made the assertion a trans adult is going to push their kid into being trans as well, which mm -hmm. is nonsense. Um, so they are threatening custody of children of parents who happen to be transgender. Um, as for the age question and, and social issues, um, gender identity is an innate part of yourself. It's it's who you are inside. It's your soul. It's it's mm. the spirit in you. It's 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 your brain. You know who you are. Um, the ability to drive a car or to vote or to join the military or anything else that has an age restriction on it is because you have to have certain cognitive abilities, like quick ability at making judgment calls in traffic to avoid mm. Mm. an accident. Um, understanding all of the different traffic rules that have been assigned when you're allowed to turn uh, right versus when you're allowed to turn left, checking mm -hmm. oncoming traffic, like there are rules. You have to learn all of these things. You don't need to learn a rule to know if you're a boy or a girl or neither or both. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a sense that you mm -hmm. have inside. Um, Jessica likes to talk about the number of left-handed people and left, being left-handed used to be a crime and they considered it a sign of the devil and that kind of thing. But also if you think about it, when you were learning to write, when you were first picking up something to, to scribble, even if you're just picking up a, a rock to, to kind of toss around, you generally reach for it with one hand over the other. You're right-handed or you're left-handed. No one had to ask you if you're right-handed or left-handed. You might have potentially been taught to do things with your right hand. If you're left-handed like me, you get your hand smacked, or the person doesn't know how to help you form a letter because it's backwards to them, so they try to make you be right-handed. Mm -hmm. I can't write with my right hand. It's, it's never going to be correct. It's going to feel awkward. It's going to be difficult for anyone to read what I write because I'm not right-handed. But I can do everything with my left hand without even thinking about it. And it's the same thing with your gender. You know who you are, or you know what's right and what doesn't feel right. And being forced to have to be a person who you aren't, to wear the clothes, to answer the social norms, what you're taught in your family a boy should do or a girl mm -hmm. should do, it just feels wrong to you, and then you can't focus on anything else. You can't focus on the rest of your happiness. You can't mm -hmm. focus on your education because you have all this noise in your head of I'm supposed to act a certain way, but that just feels wrong. So it's really difficult when you aren't acknowledged, when you aren't affirmed, when you aren't allowed to transition to live correctly because you're constantly having to think about it. How am I supposed to act? How am I supposed to behave? It's the things that you're being taught going against what you know is real and correct and true. For a medical transition, there are regulations, there are restrictions, there's an age of majority, a legal age when you're allowed to do things, but also with a parent's guidance and with informed consent, mm. young people can make decisions. They have to do about all kinds of healthcare issues every single day. We don't ask an eight-year-old, are you really comfortable being treated for cancer? We don't ask an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old who breaks their arm, now, do you really understand that we're about to set that and you're going to be in a cast? Mm. Do you want that or do you want your arm to maybe, you know, be deformed later because it didn't heal correctly? Mm. We're not doing that. So kids are able to make decisions. They understand. You talk to them in an age-appropriate manner, and they can make decisions for themselves. Mm. I don't know... If many people in this country are able to access things like puberty blockers, it's something in the U.S. that they 
are making wild accusations about that they're handing them out to kids like candy in school, they are incredibly expensive. Most people who want access to that kind of health care are not able to get it. Um, it's still out of their reach financially. Now it's illegal in many states, so there's no way that they could actually get to a doctor to get this kind of care. But it could help a person not grow up to be physically looking like the opposite gender. It would help prevent people from feeling that complete incongruence with their bodies, feeling uncomfortable, and also outing them to other people where they will then not be physically safe because mm -hmm. violence is, is a real issue. And when your body doesn't align with your gender, it puts you at risk of being outed to other people. Mm -hmm. um, so access to medical care is really important. Again, it's, it's informed consent. There are so many protections along the way. You have to visit with psychiatrists and psychologists. You have to have so many months of living as your affirmed gender consistently, persistently, insistently, because you have proven that you actually do know who you are. Mm -hmm. The rates of desistance and the rates of dissatisfaction after transitioning are minuscule. It's depending on the study between one and two percent. A 99 or 98 percent effectiveness for any healthcare condition is phenomenal. In any other medical situation, we would applaud that and say, how did you get your numbers so high? That's incredible. But with the trans community, 98, 99 percent satisfaction isn't quite enough because one person might be upset. One person might have made a mistake. And that's why we're seeing backlash and why they're trying to then take away the care that those 98, 99% of people would have been happy with. So I think it, rather than, than questioning, can people know who they are? Is it age appropriate? Look at the satisfaction rates and you know that they've learned over the last several decades how this care works how to administer health care in a very safe and effective way. And again, you're able to provide informed consent when you know who you are. Cisgender mm -hmm. people, people whose bodies and gender and sex align, never have to prove they're cisgender to anyone else. Mm -hmm. Everyone just says, oh, you're a man? You know mm -hmm. you're a boy? Good for you. Yay. Mm -hmm. I would worry if you didn't. And yet people insist that a trans person somehow come up with a way to articulate how do you know why do you know mm -hmm. explain it to me no one else has to do that so we really should just put our faith in people that they know who they are on the inside i, I want to follow well, up with something debbie said there is um talking about detransition you've heard the term detransition how many kids detransition there's a study out of the UK that said 0 0.47 0 0.47 half of 1% of children that uh, people that have started their transition at a young age detransition and 67% of those detransition because of family pressure and religious pressures it is so so minute mm. people do not detransition think about how difficult it is to come down to your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, and say, I want to live my life in my true gender. So it is very, very, very rare. But like Debbie said, they do use those very, very minuscule statistics to use discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community. Thank you to the panelists. Um, I'm sure um, I need to also acknowledge that you have sat here, giving us another 30 minutes over the time that we had uh, stated, which is actually a sign that the conversation is really um, something that is meaningful for you. Um, thank you uh, to the speakers and the panelists. I am going to um, ask, um, who are? <laughs> I am going to ask Dr. Zina Cupido, who's the director of Fundani, to come and help us close while we give a hand to the speakers when they find their way back. Thank you so much.
Okay, so I'm not going to be keeping you very long, but just I'd like you to give yourselves also a round of applause for your engagement. Um, I'm wanting to say congratulations to, to uh, Ms. Morala and her team for organizing this really engaging and important event. I think uh, not often enough do we make the space and time to have these conversations around gender-based violence or LGBT communities and how it impacts the everyday work that we do. So uh, what I've done is just created a summary and I'll send the summary to you too. Um, in terms of the topics that, that was discussed and perhaps also looking at how we take this forward because it doesn't help us having these crucial conversations if we're not prepared to put actions to those conversations. And so the first speaker, Dr. Bertolesi, was talking about the inclusive education and transgender students. And I think the most important thing there is the persistent exclusion. I think we celebrate students' access, we celebrate that stu all students have access, but we now need to unpack who has access and who is being persistently excluded. And I think that that really uh, will help us to advance these conversations of the need for academics to bridge this gap also between the research that we do in these particular areas and how do we practically implement. So thank you for that. Then when um, we looked at, um, Kani Siri was looking at the policy effectiveness and the one thing that stood out for me, the policy has no teeth. Do you remember she had said that? And I think that we have such wonderful policies. The policies are there, but what's not there is the socialization around those policies, the sensitization around those policies, because what does it mean for you and I? What does it mean when we have these policies and how do we implement that? So there has to be those kinds of either training or workshops that take place where we, where we affirm that these policies are important, but not just important to have, important to implement. Um, the other thing that I think really came out very strongly, and I, and I had to leave because I had another engagement that I needed to attend, was the inclusion of student voice. We cannot do what we do on a daily basis without the student voice. I think CPUT has come a long way in the sense that it's created those avenues for students to be included in various governance structures where students sit in committees, they sit in uh, meetings. But I think it's also important that we have these, and I don't necessarily, I believe in safe physical spaces, but I don't necessarily believe in safe spaces. I believe in brave spaces, and we need to be brave enough to disrupt the status quo so we can have these conversations. And I think today, uh, Ms. Marala was really an example of how we could do that. So again, thank you. In terms of critical crunk, uh, reflection, there's a, uh, there's a call for uh, the re-evaluation of the paradigms we find ourselves rooted in. Spe people spoke about uh, you know, deep-seated cultural beliefs, legislation, apartheid was also once legislated, didn't make it right. And so we have to look at what keeps us trapped in these particular spaces. And as hard as it is, we need to address those. Then last, last three, the model policy framework, I think there's a great opportunity for engagement with universities for us to unpack what it is that we do in terms of development of, of, of policies within CPUT and to consider where are those low-hanging fruits. Um, you know, I walked to the bathroom and for the first time, I didn't have to think which bathroom I needed to go into, but I became aware, actually, it may not be that simple for someone else. And so we take for granted the privilege that we have and some of us are sitting here very privileged when we don't 
walk in and we're aware of our identity. We're comfortable in the spaces. It's not the same for everyone. And then, of course, the last, um, the panel spoke about um, institutional accountability. And so we make up the institution. And so we ourselves need to hold ourselves accountable too in the spaces that we inhabit. But it's to look at, um, I think the speaker spoke about the need to translate labor into monitoring and evaluation. That was really stressed. Because how do we know that we've arrived if we don't know what we're looking for? And then, of course, violence and microaggression. Now, violence doesn't necessarily only mean physical violence, and I think we're all aware of that. But then there's also those microaggressions that you can't necessarily put your finger on, but you know it's there. And I think those are the kinds of things that we also need to highlight, talk about, and bring to the fore, make it visible. Um, and so, uh, based on what the panel recommended in terms of forcing these dialogues for further engagement, to help advance this discourse, to help us move forward. And then, of course, lastly, collaborative effort. This was really a very good collaborative effort. Um, and I'm wanting to, again, congratulate the team on, on pulling this together. Because it's only through this collaborative efforts that we're going to move CPUT forward. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cupido, for listening with an ear to help us see the future. Uh, in closing and in thanking us, we'll ask Kutumisho to come and close and thank us. Um, yes. <laughs> then I will, I will not come back to the, <laughs> to the podium. Thank you for being very active in your participation. <laughs> Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, uh, I thought Ms. Mahala was going to close and give the thanks. Um, because of time, let's first thank um, each and everyone who was part of, of the planning. Um, I think for you guys to stay until the very end, it shows commitment to the cause. Remember, we are creating a learning space as well as a space of engagement. And I think CDISC as well as Pillar 6 has sort of stood to their ground or to their com commitment of last year to say that we are starting these conversations so that we don't do as a tick box exercise, but as a continuous process for CPUT, as well as other partners that we are partnering with. So I'd like to thank MCT first for making sure that this is live recorded and that there's sound that is active, as well as Saratec colleagues who have um, ensured that catering was there through the help of CTIS staff. Um, CTIS, um, to thank you as well, as well as thank um, um, Pillar 6 leaders, as well as Dr. Cubido for um, leaving the institutional meeting to attend on behalf of Pillar 6 committee members as well. Um, and just also to give thanks to um, the colleagues who are coming from abroad. Um, I know you are here for a few more days and we do acknowledge your presence here. And I'm sure um, next time we'll have a better plan as CPUT to give you a tour as well as within our various campuses because we don't have just this campus, we've got other campuses as well. And also thank um, Dr. Johannes um, for always coming in when we request you to come. I think um, you have been doing these presentations for us through ITF as well as this platform. So it means that we do want to continue engaging with everyone and also making sure that it's not our baby as cities, but it's that it's everyone's baby. Also thank um, colleagues from China Dynamics who have come in. Um, they have left because of other commitments, as well as Commission um, for Gender Equality. I think we do acknowledge them as they have indicated that they want to partner with us moving forward as well. I want to give thanks to our facilitators, which is first to look who is internal. Um, we spoke offline, but we do thank him officially. And also thank Sto. I think Sto, um, our relationship with you goes beyond these walls. And thanking you is never enough <laughs> because this program in, on its own would not have been possible if we did not have a meeting with SCO and we could have this network of link of colleagues coming from abroad. So we do recognize that one as well. And you know with student leaders, Mama, it's very difficult to thank them because they will put us to account. 
uh, in many other spaces. But I think today they can firmly say that we are taking that first step of doing things, practical solutions, and doing practical conversations as well with those solutions. And I think the way forward um, or in the closing remarks speaks volumes to say that we need to have an institutional accountability, whereas even management level, because I think the only issue was that that you don't see management present is that there was an institutional meeting planned in the institutional calendar. Hence, you don't see the VCs, the executive directors um, present here today. It's because there was a clash in calendars. But we do know that these conversations are led by executive management through the office of cities. So we do also acknowledge our management for indicating support in these conversations. So we do thank the president of the SRC, Usima as well, um, the queer unicorns in entirety because, you know, when we made the call, it was not an easy call, but you guys were like, we had to come, 10 of us, and because of numbers, and not knowing that students would not pitch today, we had to sort of um, leave out a few guests, hence we opted to do online. But overall, colleagues, I want to thank each and everyone who came here today, and we wish you to travel safely. Oh, Juliana, sorry. But we spoke, um, thank you, the um, Triangle Project. Um, I, I know that my colleague Zikona has initiated a, 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 a partnership with other stakeholders. Um, you know, when you, don't, when you work with, uh, with external stakeholders, you bring a, a different view from what we are already sharing within our own spaces. So I think you, as Zikona did indicate, that this is also for future purposes and future engagement. So we do acknowledge each and everyone um, who has partaken in the program. Um, as well as who are still interested in contributing in the way forward. I think because of time, and I'm closing now, there will be a link sent to you with a, a, a chance for you to, to send a contribution as to um, your comments, as to um, your, what was your view in the overall engagement, what could be done better as well. So do expect that link. It should be sent in the next coming days, but do expect that link so that we foster continuous engagement so that you can say, see this, you must be accountable in the next engagement if this has not been done. It's a, it's a, co it's a collaborative effort, but we will all account when things don't happen because everyone must play part in this one-month CPUT. So thank you, colleagues, for your time.